Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hello and welcome to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. I'm Paul Bromwell filling in for the podfather, Conrad Thompson. But fear not, this show will have plenty of Conrad as this one's going to be very special today as we're going to look back at some of Bruce and Conrad's conversations regarding the chairman of the board, Vincent Kennedy McMahon. And boys and girls, this would not have been possible without the help of our brilliant YouTube manager, Steve Kaufman, who has worked diligently to compile some of the all-time best Vince McMahon moments from this show. So when we get tweets like this one from Mike Pru over on the Twitter machine, at mpru85, asking for a Vince McMahon megasode, saying... I said this a while back. We need a compilation episode of Bruce's best Vince McMahon stories. Now that you're doing Megasodes, the time is right. We turn to Steve and he works his magic. For starters, let me throw it to Conrad to explain why there's never been a Vince McMahon episode on something to wrestle. It's kind of fun sometimes. I get I get messages on Twitter. When are you guys going to do a Vince McMahon episode? Buddy, uh, about twice a week. Between Jim Ross and uh, Bruce Pritchard. Pretty regular basis. So with that, the gauntlet has been laid down by the man himself. We'll take a semi-chronological approach to the story of Vince McMahon. The first set of clips is Bruce trying to explain the enigma that is Vince McMahon. And this one includes stories about the Stanford School of Dance and Pat Patterson smoking at Vince McMahon's house. Another question here from Twitter. This is, this is a dandy. How do you describe Vince McMahon to a stranger? Ooh, uh, a crazy genius. Uh, John Layfield and I had this discussion not long ago, talking about how people say that he's out of touch and that he's, he's lost it, he's this, that, and the other thing. I remember those same comments about him in 1984, <laughs> that he doesn't know what he's doing, He's killing the wrestling business. He doesn't have a clue. Um, he's lost. He's lost his mind. I, I don't know how many times I, I heard it in the '90s uh, or <laughs> early 2000 while I was there. Look, I'll put his track record up against anybody, but it was always intense, and it was it was insane at times, but it was never boring. You know, when I first came to work there, and uh, uh, there was a time there in the early going, and then had my little interruption in service, I came back. Uh, it was here's my point is riding in the car with him when our, when we go on the road to do TV, before the airplane, before the chart, the Lear, and you know all the Black Beauty and all that stuff. We were flying commercial, uh, and we were renting a car, and he he always drove the car he was riding in. He drove. As best I recall, I might be wrong on that, but I think he drove most of the time, didn't he? A lot of times, yeah. And then, and, and then when, uh, like when we were doing Raw, and it was just like me, Vince, and Pat. A lot of times, he would have Pat drive. I would have to sit shotgun, and he would sit in the back in the bartender seat, and they would just uh, piss me off. That's where Pout Boy was born. Wow. <laughs> 
But, you know, you learn a lot of things about him. You know, he, he doesn't eat food with his hands. Uh, you know, I said one time, I said, you don't eat with your hands? He said, nope. I said, how in the hell do you eat ribs? How do you eat fried chicken? I don't. I don't. <laughs> how dare you infer I might eat fried fowl? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. How dare you insist I'm normal? Yeah. <laughs> Meat on a bone? Yeah. Yeah. And they fry it, you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, I asked him one time the same thing about eating with his hands. Well, what about a sandwich? That doesn't count. I said, okay, how about pizza? I fold it over and I don't eat the part I touch. Jeez. What the f***? Oh, that's, yeah. that's way out of my leg, buddy. Hey, we got some questions here from Twitter, so you never know what you're going to get. Not, there, it's a potpourri, so here we're going we're gonna, to we'll just dock a bunch of these out and just go until we're time's up. It should be some fun shit here. Let's go for uh, it. Uh, regarding WWE, and here, so it's a three-parter, and you can answer any or all of it, uh, it however you choose. Why did you leave WWE? Who told you you were going to be gone from WWE? Did you expect it was going to happen, and do you think there will ever be a reconciliation? Okay. First of all, I was fired. Second of all, Stephanie McMahon fired me. Third of all, I did not know. And last but not least, you never say never in this business. And it's it's just that. It's business. And many years have passed, and time moves on and heals all wounds. And, you know, hey, you and I both, we're no strangers to being <laughs> fired by the McMahon. No. So, you know, it's like shit happens. Yep. So, um, but, yeah, that's it, man. I, I was fired. I, I was asked to leave, and I left, and it was time. Everything runs at course. I had a great run, and I loved my time there. How long were you there? 22 years. So, do you have uh, any interesting Vince McMahon stories you can leave us with? Not if I don't have music. Do I have music for the last one? What music do you need? Yeah, can... uh, well, it doesn't matter. I'll do. You know what? Fuck it. I can improvise. I can do this shit without music. Because that's we, we were in this town right here one time. And the beautiful thing about being on the West Coast is you finish up early. You can actually go out, have a dinner. The fuck is that? You asked for music. Yeah, of course I get the wrong fucking music. But anyway, um, you, you can get in and you can actually go get a meal. You can go out and, and still get to bed and get some sleep before TV the next day. So we had done a pay-per-view and we came into Vegas and we're in early. And everybody goes to the hotel. Well, I'm happy because now I can sleep. So I take my night-night medicine and I'm ready to go to sleep and I'm in bed when I get a phone call. And the phone rings. I pick it up and go, hey, boss wants to go out. I said, look, I don't give a fuck what Stephanie wants to do. I ain't going out. <laughs> so it was like, come on, boy, we got to go. And I'm like, fuck, I don't want to go out. You got to go. So I get dressed, but I get dressed strategically. I put on shorts and flip-flops and a T-shirt. Because wherever we're going to go in Vegas, they're probably not going to let me in in shorts and uh, flip-flops and t-shirt so i go downstairs meet everybody and vince and everybody's there and all this shit and kevin dunn walks down and kevin dunn also is in shorts and flip-flops i'm like yes so we go we go to the win and when we get to the win vince is like god damn what do you guys want to do and you got all these fuckers coming up speaking in their watches like vince mcmahon is on the floor and they all descend on us and vince says well let's go to the club the club was the tryst and you, you walk over there, walking in line, and there's like a line a mile long, people waiting to get in. And as we're all approaching, you can hear on their radios and the walkie-talkies them saying, oh, that's a no-go to the two in the uh, shorts and flip-flops. That's a no-go, no flip-flops, not coming in. Then you go, they're with Mr. McMahon. To which, all of a sudden, they're going, hey, guys, come on in. <laughs> we're like, Fuck. So we get in this little VIP section in the bottle service, and we get hammered, just fucked up bad. And I get a phone call, and it's from my buddy John Paul Shellnut, who's friends with Billy Gibbons from CZ Top. He says, where are you, boy? I said, well, I'm in Vegas. Well, we're in Vegas. So well, we're at the Tryst. Well, we're going to be at the Tryst in a few minutes. So we're sitting there partying, Billy Gibbons, CZ Top, Vince McMahon, all this shit, and all these people having a good old time. You guys ever... 
You see the movies where there's on a dance floor and all of a sudden the dance floor widens out and there's just two people in the middle of the floor dancing. You know, got a girl, they're cutting a rug and doing all these moves and shit together. Well, we're a little bit, we're, we're elevated up on this platform. So we can see onto the dance floor and kind of over the top of it and shit. And when we walk over there and we look over the edge, sure enough, in the middle of this circle, there's two fucking people. One of them is Billy Gibbons. And Gibbons is dancing his ass off and he's doing this shit. And that's all he's doing. And it's bizarre. But trust me, it gets more bizarre. Because as we pan over, almost like in a movie, you pan over and you look, and he's dancing with Vince McMahon. <laughs> and the damnedest thing, and the reason I remember this so vividly was because there was a rap song playing. And it was Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire. And I, you know, you can recognize lines and shit, but it's a fucking rap. Like, how do you do that to Johnny Cash? And I go over, and the only thing that can fuck up Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire rap version is to see Vince McMahon dancing to it. <laughs> and he thinks he's good. So when you guys see Vince dance on TV and shit, that shit is real, and uh, he actually really does do that in public. Are we ready about to talk about how we spend our days? I think it's time. Well, we asked earlier today, and before I go ahead and go home, I can't thank everybody up here enough. Everybody came out, and thank you for making this all a reality. And I uh, had, had a shitload of fun, and we are going to have a shitload more fun. I, I promise you, and I promise everybody up here, this ain't the last live show that we're going to do. Uh, Mayhem writes in, on the rare occasions, maybe a family vacation, is there a time when Vince isn't thinking about business? What does he do for fun? Does he have a hobby? Does he collect anything? What non-business subject would Vince ever talk about? Loves to work out. Get a pump on. Yes, you do, sir. And by I say, what a pump you've got. It's funny then, because you guys have nothing in common, you and him. Just wrestling. Oh, working out. <laughs> 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 Michael L. He's, he's, he's a normal goddamn human being. Yes. I mean, you know, he, you talk about football. You talk about just uh, shit in general. Well, there you go. Uh, WrestleMania is three hey. nights now. We'll be right back. Okay. Hold on. Chris Fault writes in, why do faces rarely ever help other faces when they're being attacked by heels, unless they are directly involved in the storyline. Seems like half the locker room are dicks for not helping out a fellow fan favorite. Yeah, I agree. They are dicks. Yeah, no arguing that Bob writes in, does Bruce ever pretend to be Vince over the headset to the announcers during a live broadcast just to fuck with them? <laughs> uh, no, I, I have my own ways of fucking with them. I haven't, but I will this Friday. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the idea. Yeah. Uncle Jesse writes in, do you think when Vince McMahon eventually passes away, hopefully a hundred years from now that he would want it turned into a storyline somehow? Wow. That's, that's a good one. Probably not. No. I think that Vince would, in Vince's mind, I bet you that he would probably just want to go away and have everything go on without missing a beat. Another one here from Eldridge during Andre, the giant's documentary, when asked about Andre's death, Vince was clearly emotional about it. What are the wrestler deaths affected Vince in a major way? I think anybody that he touched, he, he definitely has been affected the, the, you go back and people like Eddie Guerrero and just the, any, anyone Owen Hart, the, the guys that, that were gone when they were with us, that was just highly emotional because it's part of your family. And we travel so much together. We do everything together that when you lose a brother or a sister, 
it's it's devastating. It's it's very emotional. Andre and Vince were the same age, mm. and they were very close. Andre had that history with his father, and continued on with Vince. And I don't think that they were. I don't think that they had completely reconciled when Andre left. So I think that hit Vince even more so. But they all hit hard. I you know. It just, it just really, it really depends, and, and it sucks because it is a fraternity and it is a family. Sometimes you may be fighting with a brother or sister. It doesn't hurt any less when you lose them. Well, but I, I don't think I ever really put together that they were close in age. Vince is only nine months older than Andre, which is crazy to think about. Some great friend of the show, Efren, writes in, do you still call him Sir Vince, Mr. McMahon? And have you ever called him a name? He told you to never, ever call him again. Hmm. We get that question a lot. Like for Eric, people want to know, do you call him Hulk or Terry? And Eric says, well, kind of both. It depends. Yeah. It depends on the setting. It depends on the situation. Is that the same answer for Vince? Yeah. It's usually, it'll you know, when I greet him, it's like, you know, Hey Vince, but I'll, I, you know, yes, sir. No, sir. Sure. Of course. But I do that. I do that with you. I do that with everybody. That's just the way I was raised growing up in the South, baby. Right. And, uh, I think one of the funniest things was when I called him blue boy because he was where he was wearing like blue shorts and a blue shirt and blue, like, uh, athletic socks that had blue tops to them and blue shoes. And Pat Patterson and I were outside at the house and we saw him from afar and he was trying to find a glass in the kitchen in this big, huge house in Florida. And I'm doing commentary as dusty narrating him trying to find the glass because he didn't know where anything was. None of us did because it's like our first time there. And he's opening up all these cabinets and saying, well, look at him. Blue boy ain't got a clue where he is. Ain't got a clue. He just, he just wants a glass. Loves to have some cool, cool water. Maybe put a couple ice cubes in and have, have some fine scotch put over the top of it. But blue boy is a little confused right now. And for the rest of that trip, he was blue boy. <laughs> blue boy. This blue boy, I'm talking to you. I, I don't think we ever told him he was being called blue boy, but, uh, I, I know I did it to his face and I just don't know that he knew I was referring to him. David Martin writes in, what's the biggest change in the company since Bruce's latest return from quote unquote hiatus compared to his last run? Oh God, it's, it's a completely different company. It's just so much more professional and just so much more, um, you know, it's, it's corporate. It's, it's big. It's, it's a, uh, it's a monster. And it always was, but at the same time, it's just bigger, nicer. And, and, um, I don't know, it makes you kind of makes you proud when people used to talk about you're in the wrestling business and look down their nose at you. And now when you say, oh, with WWE and they, oh my God, and they, they know all about it. And it's, um, look, I'm proud of the business. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the company and it's pretty cool to be a part of it all. Um, so the, the biggest change is when I went back and I remember the office is one way. And then you go back and the offices that you see in movies, you know, with the big boards and shit moving and state of the art technology around every corner. Um, that's what it is now. And, it, and it's just the way that it's grown. And that's amazing to me. No, that is cool. Teddy, here's what we're going to do. Pick a kid out. We'll get a nice little, nice little kid. Innocent looking. About, I don't know, five, six, eight years old. And, you know, it doesn't matter. And you get him up. Find the cutest little bastard you can find. And all he's got to do is bounce a basketball ten times. And you show him. You let him practice. Make sure he can do it. And we count along, and he gets one, two, three, four, five, six, six, and all crowds behind him. And he gets eight, nine, and whoops! Well, what happens when you don't do the job? You don't. 
don't get the money. <laughs> Talk to me about smoking. Anybody who met Pat Patterson knows that uh, he enjoyed a cigarette or two. Oh, God damn. Or two. Shit. In Vince's house <coughs> during the during the winter, he would just go to the front porch and smoke. And uh, he would throw his butts, his cigarette butts, off the porch into, like, the, the landscaping there. They had bushes and shit there. Well, I didn't know that people actually did this. You probably do this. I, I didn't realize this was a thing back in the, back in the day, but in between seasons, like they would come in and have the landscaping people take out the shit like during the winter and put in things for the spring and the summer. So what would happen is Pat during the winter would throw cigarette butts in there. You couldn't see them. Because of all the fucking snow and all the other shit. When the snow melted <laughs> and it's time for the fucking landscapers to come in and change everything, it looked like a fucking ashtray because of all the cigarette butts and shit that, uh, that Patrick had thrown in there. He was, you know, when, when he retired, I forget which time this was that he retired, but he couldn't help himself. The, uh, the landscapers always, there were always landscapers at Vince's house doing something somewhere. So Jim Cornette and I are meeting with Vince out by the pool. We would sit under like this little gazebo thing. And as we're sitting there, uh, we hear one of the landscapers come up and, and, and Pat had called me and told me he was going to do this. So I knew about it. And I hear the landscaper come up with a leaf blow. They're blowing shit all over the place and come up and go, hey, Pat. And he's like, comes up and said, Vince is inside on the phone. So, you know, it's not going to work. But, and Vince could take hours on the phone sometimes. Pat's sitting there and we'll bullshit me and Cornette and Patrick and all this stuff. And so I finally see Vince is off the phone. I see he's coming back outside. So, okay, go, go back down. So we're sitting there, and as we're uh, working, we hear this. <laughs> and he starts blowing the leaves. And Vince is like, ah, it'll just be a second. He's just got this one little spot here to do. Pat's got his shorts on. He's got a hat, you know, way down over his, the, over his head where you really can't tell. But instead of blowing the leaves away, Pat's blowing all the dirt and the leaves up into our faces. And Vince is like, God damn it. Hey, hey, pal. Hey, pal. Nothing. Boom, blows more shit. Vince comes to the edge. Hey, amigo. If I <laughs> with that, all this shit comes blowing up in fucking Vince's face till finally Vince comes down around the pool, down the steps to go and uh, confront this guy face to face. And right when he does, Pat sticks the fucking air blower uh, leaf blower thing right in Vince's face and goes, I just wanted to blow you Vince and realize it was Pat Patterson. But that in the middle of his fucking day, that's what Pat would come do just to fuck with us. One time they went to, they went to, uh, um, uh, Florida for Christmas. And you know, those giant, uh, concrete statues and shit. Some people have in their yard. Yep. Well, we had a place and just went out of business and I went and talked to the guy about it uh, a couple weeks ago. They had like the this gigantic, um, I think the chicken was plastic, but they had like these concrete, big, huge. When I say huge, I mean, they're, they're like fucking 20 feet tall. Some of the statues and shit they had there. And so Pat and I go, hey, we want to rent these for like a week and we'll pay to have them delivered. We'll pay to have them get picked up. And the idea was that we were going to put them in Vince's courtyard so that when he came home from Christmas break in Florida, he comes driving up down the winding driveway and shit and runs right into this fucking 20 foot chicken. 
and the best plans got spoiled. But we, I, yeah, it was, it was going to be an expensive rib. And then, uh, somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who had to get the exact address and had to get, you know, Oh yeah, I know the McMahons. Let me call them. Called over to the office and everything got spoiled. Didn't, uh, Pat have some fun with an ashtray and one of Vince's cars once. Oh, fuck. So then she's had this really nice clone and it was convertible. Vince used to park it. Uh, when he'd come to the studio down by the loading dock, and in the Clinet was a beautiful crystal ashtray. It looked very nice, you know, all that shit. But Pat would make it a point that whenever the top was down on the Clinet to go by and have a cigarette and put his cigarettes out in Vince's crystal ashtray. Drove Vince banana, as Pat Patterson would say. What the fuck? They're going banana tonight at a pace at JKKJ's. That is one of the, yeah. the critical points of a, a Pat Patterson impression is you, you mix up your plurals, right? So if there's an S you drop the S Sean, Michael, oh, and the crowd go banana. Yeah. Or if you're just going to eat, you know, it depends. Yes. Let's talk about, uh, his relationship with Vince, because I'm sure over the years, there were some fights. Oh boy. Yeah. It, you know, it was Vince and, and Pat. Look, we worked so many hours that you, you get sick of each other and you need a break. Um, and Vince would argue you never get sick of us and shit. And, but we, we would, we would need breaks. Vince could be a little intense. And when we would do, especially when we started Monday Night Raw on the road, Vince would be doing commentary. Pat and I would write the shows. I would kind of run the backstage while also trying to produce Vince on commentary, and Pat would handle all the wrestling shit. You had to get in the car and get going to the next town as soon as you can because you had to drive at night. So... We would get in the car and Vince and I would just start going at it. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. You know, you did this. You did this. You did this. Why didn't that happen? Why didn't this happen? And, and we would fight. I mean, it would, it would loud, loud voices and a lot of cursing and a lot of shit. Just one night, Pat pulls off the side of the road, pulls into a, a bar. Parks the car, gets out, walks inside the bar. Vince and I are still going at each other. We don't realize anything other than after a little while, about 10, 15 minutes. Like, is he taking a shit in there? What the fuck is going on? Let's go in and see what's going on. Vince and I get out of the car. We go in the bar. Pat's sitting at the end of the bar, smoking a cigarette, drinking a drink. We go down. Um... Patrick, what are you doing? I'm going to fucking have my cigarette and have my drink, and you two motherfuckers can go to the other end of the bar, get all your shit out, and when you're done, then we can get back in the car and fucking go. Tired of listening to it. Spat basically managed us to the other end of the bar for us to fight our shit out and then come down and tell him when we were done fighting so he would drive us the rest of the way. Lindsay has another follow-up. I'm doubling down on the Lindsay questions because, you know, we've got like 12 female listeners. So let's, let's do some of those. All right. Rock on Lindsay. Come on. How would you rate Vince at commentating? And who would you <laughs> say is his fa favorite commentary partner? And why was it Jerry Lawler? Oh God. No, I'd say it was Jesse Ventura was, was the best, mm. uh, with Vince. And, uh, I look, Vince was terrible. Vince, Vince never called shit. It was like, ah, oh, bye. And then from there, ah, uh, Yokozuna with an arm drag. <laughs> Wait a minute. He's got him. He's got him. One, two. Ah, oh, no, no, oh, no. Um, Vince just was, was cliches and would take you on a ride. However, emotion wise, I think it, you would be hard pressed to find anybody that could match the, emotional roller coaster that Vince would take you on. Um, sometimes it was hyped up a little bit, uh, over the top. Yeah. 
but it was, I mean, I, I, to this day, I, I still do the, you know, what do I now? Uh, anytime or just, uh, it's just there because it was, there were, there were a lot of incisions back in the day. Oh, what a maneuver. I, I, I hope sometimes I just want to imagine, just lie to me and tell me this is the case. As you're seated next to Vince these days in Gorilla, you both got the headsets on, you're both watching the monitor, that you just break out into one, two, he got it. Oh, no, he didn't. And Vince has to yell, God damn it, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that shit out. I'm trying to watch the match. Uh, no, I, I did that. I'd probably be, you know, God damn, that's good shit. <laughs> mm. If well, only they could do that now. No, and I don't. I don't think that Vince ever f- fancied himself a great play-by-play guy. Was it more out of necessity? Do you think, just in terms of he knows what we're trying to sell better than anyone, so why not have him do it? In, in the beginning, without a doubt, it was out of necessity because his dad's play-by-play man just walked off the job one day. Wow. So, yeah that that was that was why Vince had to do that job, never having done it before. And then later on, it was, he was the guy, he was the face that had done it for so long that he continued to do it. When I came in 1987, the shit, probably the the very first or second month that I was there, that there was always a search for that next play by play guy. Even, you know, even then in 87, it was like, he didn't want to do it. He, he wanted to find the right guy to come in and do play by play. Ian says, what was the last time Vince McMahon had a vacation? Had a what? Vacation. Vacation. A what? A vacation. Uh, yeah. I couldn't even begin to guess. I mean, his idea of vacation at this point is probably going to the shows, right? Well, that's his relaxation. Yes. Uh, his follow-up is what's Bruce's favorite place to go on vacation. A beach. Yeah, I thought so. A beach with no one around and a private beach where they just bring you drinks in the water and feed you and no one talks to you. No phones. No nothing. Here's the most weird question I'll ask today. Rory says, Bruce, do you shave your armpits? Uh, Currently, no, but always did, yeah. Wait, why did you? Oh, God, it's much cleaner, much nicer. When it gets to the summer, I'll shave them. Yeah. I got the winter fur on now. <laughs> <laughs> the back tummy and pits will go. Wait, you shave your stomach too. Well, baby, listen, you got to shave your, you got to shave your tummy here. It, it slims you. You got all that hand shit I on remember that. This now. It, it makes you look sloppy and, and fat. So you shave and I'm looking to dream more. But I did it. I still look sloppy and fat, but I got a fucking smooth belly. We've also heard about Vince McMahon as a commentator, which I'm guessing is how many of us came to know him before learning he was also the CEO of the company. It's a modern day equivalent to Tim Cook playing a coach on Ted Lasso. And we've got to get into the connection between Vince and Bruce from Bruce getting hired by the boss man to their ever evolving relationship. Uh, Jeffrey Rose wants to know, why did Vince choose you to come to New York with him? He brought lots of territories over the days and there were tons of employees for those. So why did he choose you? Well, Eddie Gilbert had gone up and met with him in 1986. Yeah. Had to be 86. And Eddie had asked if I was interested in going to New York. He gave my name to Vince, told Vince about me, and called, and we talked. And I mean, that's it. I I don't know that there were that many people that wanted to go to New York that were qualified or capable, what have you. Um, I actively sought the job out, and I actively wanted to go to New York and do whatever it took to succeed. So maybe that's why I... I interviewed, <laughs> you know, I talked to the guy, I told him I wanted to, to go to work and I wanted to be there and do what I had to do. We get lots of questions about this. Let's just answer it here. J dog wants to know 
Are there any plans for something else to wrestle coming back to the WWE network? Never say never. Any Jess McMahon stories that Vince has told you about? No, you know, I, other than Jess being the pioneer in, in the boxing world, Jess McMahon, who was Vince McMahon's grandfather, um, was one of the first promoters in Madison Square Garden to promote boxing and later on wrestling. But I don't know that Vince was ever around him. I have no idea. But uh, no, there's not. Just you, you go back and look at the history. I tell you, you know, Madison Square Garden looks at Jess McMahon very fondly because of all the things that he did while promoting there. So it's uh, one of those names in the boxing world that, is definitely revered. All right. One last question before we wrap things up here. Francis wants to know, uh, what's the one thing you think people don't know that they should know about Vince McMahon? That he's human. And well, God damn, let me think about that. Maybe he isn't. Uh, um, but no, really and truly that, that he's human and, uh, just like everybody else and has a very tough exterior that he puts out there, but he's, you know, the biggest thing is, is he's, he is fair and he's human. Uh, I think a lot of people just look at him as a, a larger than life being and forgets that he's a human being sometimes. Uh, Dan wants to know, Bruce, as far as you know, is there any such thing as safe steroid usage? Yes. As far as I know, I, and again, I'm no expert on the subject by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if you saw me without my shirt, you would understand. Um, and trust me, I will never do that to anyone, but under a doctor's supervision, steroids were used to rehabilitate and help muscle rebuild faster. That's what it's used for. And I think that under a doctor's supervision for what it was used for to help rehabilitate and repair muscle damage. Yeah. I think that steroids have a purpose and used under a doctor's supervision are perfectly safe. Uh, it's been a long, strange ride, man. This really has. And, and going through, the podcasts and different things, just kind of going through life. One of the number one questions I always get from people is what's Vince McMahon really like? And there's a couple of Vince McMahons. There's, there's the performer and the producer who likes to explain to talent, God damn, you got to bring it down. Make it real. Don't overact. And I always kind of would throw back to him and say, no, Vince, I got this, man. It's kind of like I'd like to show guys an example of that by telling him to go back and watch WrestleMania 3. He's standing in front of 93,000 people. Welcome to WrestleMania! Bring it down. And then there's the, the human being, Vince McMahon. That's, that's the guy we've got to know over the years. And when we would spend as much time with him as we did, you get these little intimate stories about his life. And one day, Pat Patterson and I are sitting out by the pool, and Pat had one joke. And that joke was, Ah, oh, Vince is so rich. He's got two thermometers for the pool. One to tell you how hot it is, one to tell you how cold it is. Ah, <laughs> he'd laugh his ass off. So one day he tells this joke. He told like every other day. And Vince goes on to explain that he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth, that he had actually gone through some hard times in his life. Real hard times. We're not talking about funky like a monkey, hard times, or nothing like that shit. We're talking hard time. And he explained that at one point in his life, he had declared bankruptcy. And as he's telling us this story, he's talking about how he went to the courthouse to sign the papers, make it all final. 
he came out of the courthouse to wait for his wife to pick them up because they only had one vehicle. And as he's waiting on the steps of the courthouse, he sees that vehicle enter. However, it's being towed because it had broken down. In the front seat of the car is his wife, Linda, and their son, Shane McMahon. And Linda at this time is pregnant with their sweet little daughter, Stephanie. They go home. They're so poor at this point in their life, they're not in an apartment, they're not in a home, they're in a trailer. They're living in a trailer, and it is so cold on this day in Hartford, Connecticut, that everything in the trailer had frozen, including the pipe for the plumbing. And it was that blue shit, like on a plane, and then frozen solid. And Vince had to get out, and he had to dig a path all the way around the trailer to get to the deal where he unscrewed it and saw that all everything had frozen solid. And he has an ice pick, and he's chipping away at this frozen shit. And he's telling him, I'm chipping away, and chipping away, and, 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 and frozen urine, and frozen feces all over, and, and it's fucking up my fresh manicure. And I'm like, I'm going to stop. You're bankrupt. You have no money. You're filing for bankruptcy. You only got one car, and it's broken. You're living in a trailer that is frozen with frozen shit and piss, but you still have a manicure. Without hesitation, he says this, well, goddamn, pal, got to have class. You fast forward many, many years. I got fired in 2008. After I got fired in 2008, I went to work for TNA. So as you can imagine, I too had to file for bankruptcy. And when I did, for whatever reason, I uh, felt the need to call Vince McMahon when I got home. And I called him, and I said, uh, hey Vince, just wanted to let you know, Steph and I filed for bankruptcy today. And his response was, God damn, good for you, pal. I'm proud of you. Now, if you ever go bankrupt, I'm not sure that that's the response you would be looking for from someone, but I'm not sure what I was going to get. And I went on to explain to him that, I said, hey, Vince, on the way to the courthouse, we stopped and got a Manny Petty. So I thought that's what you should do. And God is my witness without hesitation. He says, God damn, pal, I gotta have class. So that's the guy I know. Let's uh let's talk about something that Vince loves. Chris wants to know what impression does Bruce do that Vince likes the most and which is his least favorite? Do you have an impression that pisses Vince off? And does he have a favorite? Uh he pretends to get frustrated when I do him, but he really loves it. Um well, all my shit's great. Does he like Dusty? I feel like Dusty's well, probably his favorite. Guy. Everybody likes Dusty a little bit. And then get, then, then get in the JR a little bit. Sassafras. And, and, oh, that's real nice. Real nice. Playing a little ha-ha on old JR. Um, Does he still hear your, your Jerry Jarrett? Does he still get a kick out of that? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, fuck. Huh? Oh, yeah. He, and he, yeah, actually... Yeah, Jerry Jarrett's a good one. Uh, Pat. But I, I do. I mean, I people think I just do it on this show. And I, oh, my God, you'd never do that to their face. I've done every one of them to every one of their faces. I got to ask, what's he think of your Jim Cornette? Goddamn. I, I, you know, shit, he does Jim. Everybody does Jim Cornette. Vince has a Jim Cornette impression? Yeah, it sounds a lot like mine, though. Okay. Motherfucker. Double cheese. You took Jim Cornette's no goddamn cheese on a fucking cheeseburger. How the fuck do you have a goddamn burger without fucking cheese? Double cheese on a double cheeseburger, motherfucker. It tickles me. The idea of of thinking you guys are sitting around. You're sitting around a table. (laughs) Bastard. And somebody might question a piece of. uh, (laughs) 
I'm not going again. Extra cheese, motherfucker. <laughs> it's better when I can see you. <laughs> I know. He tried to fake me out. It like you're trying to look at see folks, what he's doing is he's trying to look at me and like look like he's gonna say something so he'll expect me to upcut it. But I don't do that because I know when he's actually gonna say something, and then when he does it. Yeah, here it comes. I just say motherfucker. This scene right here, what we're doing is a lot like that scene in national lampoons Christmas and you are the dog snots. And I'm telling our audience right now, it's easier if we just let him finish. You know, you got a little Mississippi leg hound in you is what I'm trying to say. I have no idea what the fuck that, what you just called me. Okay. So there's a dog that humps everybody and everything in the movie national lampoons Christmas with Chevy chase. Maybe you've heard of it. Oh, cousin Eddie shitters full this Christmas one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not really, uh, I've seen it. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that's not the best Christmas movie of all time? Are you, are we fixing to get hot right now? Are you going to sit here and disparage the good damn name of national lampoons Christmas with Chevy chase? Uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus is in that. She was hot. Okay. You remember right. now? Yes. Yeah, she was right. in it. Yeah. She was the neighbor. Yeah, that's see I don't remember all the other shit though. All right. Well there's a scene where the dog is humping people's legs. Cousin Eddie's dog is humping everybody. And yep. cousin Eddie says it's easier if you just let him finish. The idea being he's gonna keep humping you until it just comes out, so just let him squirt and then we can move on with our day. So what's the fucking goddamn analogy back to me? Because you get in this fucking shtick coma with all the Jim Cornette shit and I'm trying to talk and you're cutting me off. So I just like, okay, let's just let him get it out of his system. And then we can move on with the show. Okay, fine. Mississippi leg hound. I don't know. still know what that means, but okay. Chris wants to know the iron sheet. Fuck tweet. you motherfucker. <laughs> there we go. Ryan wants to know if Vince challenged you to play him one-on-one -on -one in one of these, what would you pick ping pong billiards or darts? <laughs> oh, ping pong. Think you got him there. I think I got him. I got a chance there. He's, he's a very good pool player and he's pretty good darts. So, uh, I mean, I know he'd beat me at pool yeah. darts. Eh, I don't know. Um, but ping pong, I'm a pretty good ping pong player. Have you seen him play pool or you just know he has a badass table? Cause I have a badass table, but well, I've I seen him play. Okay. No, I've seen him. I've seen him play pool and darts. Those are old bar games. Was Vince back yeah. in the day an old school hustler? I'm sure. I had to be. But yeah, no, I've 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 actually I've, I've played him in pool, uh, but I've seen him play pool and uh, I've seen him seen him throw darts. Haven't seen him play ping pong, and I but I do know I have. Here's here's another fact. You want another fact? Because this some bitch listens to this show too. Bill Gray, my karate instructor, who uh, inducted me into the Black Belt Hall of Fame <laughs> three different times. And hey, Bill, I'm still waiting for the fourth, okay? 2020 is still going. You still have time. Uh, get me my fourth induction into the Black Belt Hall of Fame. But Bill was like a champion ping pong player in his day. And one day we went back by the park where it all started, Beverly Hills Park in Houston, Texas, where I took my first karate class and all that. And they, it was a rec center. And it's like, let's go in and play ping pong. And I smoked him. I kicked his ass so bad that he, I don't think he's ever picked up a paddle since, but he used to be a champion. And I mean, when I say I smoked him, I smoked him. I skunked his ass and we kept playing. I right, one more game, one more game. And I kept beating him. So ping pong. Yeah. Ping pong was my game. I'll whip your ass except for those. And then you want to know a real humbling deal is we went to a, uh, tennis, you know, pro tennis gimmick. Yeah. The mattress max place. And, if you've ever seen pro tennis players play ping pong, holy ukfe. I mean, they back up like 10 feet from the table and are swatting that goddamn ball, man. It's like, holy shit, dude. Like, you can't even see it. And they, they take it very seriously. So I'm not that good. But to your average ping pong player, yeah, I could probably take them. Adam wants to know, 
out of all the referees you've worked with, what makes a great referee? Again, one that is in the background and that does their job without getting in the way. And if you don't notice the referee, then that's a great referee. Uh, here's one here. Adam wants to know, has Vince ever had any issues with anything that's been discussed on the podcast? The gist is, have you gotten in trouble since you've been back for stuff we do on the podcast? And the answer is no, boys and girls, we don't talk about anything current. What the fuck? Yeah. (laughs) Boy, I know we don't talk about current stuff, but this is too good not to ask. Mayhem wants to know what was an ass chewing like from Vince back in the day? Compared to an ass chewing from Vince, like now, uh, different, you know, I think everybody grows up and I think that everyone matures in you, as you get older, you get a little bit wiser and you mellow out a little bit. And I'm not saying that Vince has really mellowed out that much. He's as intense as he ever was, but, um, his, his we, we, in ha- we handle things a lot differently than we did when we were younger. You learned, you evolved, you evolved and learned. Yes. Fred wants to know what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in gorilla. Whew. Again, those are too many to count. Um, shoot, uh, either going commercial where we weren't supposed to, or given the wrong time cues. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to fuck up there. Francis wants to know what Christmas presents. Uh, have you gotten from the boys or given to the boys over the years? Is there a funny one or an interesting one or a memorable one? God damn. I, I don't know that I've ever really exchanged any presents with any, any of the boys. Did you ever give Vince a memorable gift or he'd give you a memorable gift? Um, employment. All That's of a sudden, su- all of a sudden this is the JR podcast. Um, no, I tell you the, the, uh, my favorite gift that I gave him was a nice, uh, art bottle of ketchup, like a big fucking thing of ketchup. They had in his office, like a Heinz bottle of ketchup, but it was like a big, really nice art kind of thing. Like a Warhol type deal. Yeah, but it was an actual bottle of, it was like a ceramic bottle of ketchup. Oh, so probably, big, probably Steve Kaufman then. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Okay. I don't know. All right. Let's Hines. Huh? I <laughs> it was Heinz. Don't fucking ever compare me to Jim Ross like that. God damn it. Huh? Right. Fresh, fresh. I, 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 I don't believe in exchanging gifts with, 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 with talent. Fresh, fresh. Keep that separate Conrad. Next, what's your next, what's your next little question you got there in your book? I mean, Rajiv wants to know what are the Pritchard family traditions during the Christmas holiday? Well, let's see. We open presents. Okay. So, um, really don't have any, you know, when I was in Texas, we always had the big Christmas Eve party. And the Christmas Eve party was for members of the family, unofficial members of the family and friends to come over and, uh, just have a few drinks and eat a bunch of food and just get together on Christmas Eve. And that kind of, that kind of went away, obviously when, uh, when I moved back to Connecticut, but that was always a, a shitload of fun and you, you know, I'd have the, the, the homeless people that didn't have a lot of family. They, they would always come over and just kind of hang out and, and do that. And that was, that was one of the best ones that, that we had. Um, and then Christmas morning is you just get up and you open your presents. I don't do that shit Christmas Eve. You open your presents on Christmas morning, you have eggs, Benedict and, um, then you just chill the fuck out for the rest of the time. And I was early when my kids were younger. Now this was a lot of fun. And unfortunately it doesn't last long enough is when my kids were younger, that like Christmas party, I had Santa Claus there every year. And so all the kids from in the neighborhood will all come over to sit on Santa's lap. 
because Mr. Pritchard had a had an in with Santa, and Santa would come to my house, and he would spend an hour, and he would talk to all the little children in the neighborhood and get all their requests and everything, and then he had to go and deliver presents to the rest of the little bastards and tell them, hey, go home, go to bed, or else I'm not coming to your house. <laughs> See, I like the I like the Santa shit. And I kind of I kind of stole that one from Vince, but I did it on Christmas Eve. Christmas movie, Bruce. Where do you stand on this? It's Absolutely. a big. It is. 100%. Explain. It takes place at Christmas. That's all it takes to be a Christmas movie. Yeah. Okay, I'm with it. It's about Christmas. Yippee ki yay, motherfucker. Charlie Thrower wants to know: Do either of you guys have any fun or embarrassing road stories about the other one from your live show days? You first. I got nothing. Then neither do I. <laughs> I knew how to play that shit. Uh, Andrew wants to know. People always say everything goes through Vincent Kennedy McMahon for approval. How hands-on is Vince with products like video games? Does he get involved? Like, does the team show him mock-ups of the game for him to approve? Or what's that look like? Uh, no, he has people that, that, that does that. I want to... I'll tell you my favorite video game uh, incident with Vince is when my kids were very young. They came to the to the office. We were there. And I, when I say young, they they had to be like maybe three or four, um, but old enough to have some idea of what to do on a video game. And right outside of our office in the TV studio was one of the arcade video games that you could play while you're waiting there. And so I pulled up a chair and put my son on the chair and Kane's sitting there and he's playing this video game. And as usual, we're waiting for Vince to come into the meeting, to join the meeting. And when he came in, he saw my wife and, and kids there and was saying hello and, and all this shit. And Kane's over there playing a video game. Hey pal, what are you doing? And Vince sat there and played this arcade video game for like 15 minutes with Kane. Now Vince had no clue what the hell he was doing and neither did my son, but they played for 15 minutes and Vince was sitting there moving the controller and pounding the damn thing. And I'll never forget Brian Gwertz coming out because everybody was in the room waiting on Vince and he came out to go to the bathroom or something and sees Vince. They're playing a video game and Stephanie came in there and was like, we've all been waiting on you in here, and he's out here playing video games with my kid. So that's my favorite just video game story with Vince. It has nothing to do with the other stuff. That's people that know what the hell they're doing. That's like asking me to give input on a video game. You know, it's funny because uh, here's a peek behind the curtain. We got an email from our, our great folks who support us over at Westwood One, and they said, hey, Conrad, um, how many of your co-hosts are gamers? And I had to be honest and I said, okay, let's play hypotheticals here. I have a PS4. Bruce Pritchard has a PS4 only because his son has a PS4. And she's like, what about everybody else? I'm like, baby, my co-hosts are fucking grandpas. They don't have games. Not me. Not yet. But you know what? The way Kane's been, well, never mind. Jesse Inman wants to know, and we got this in various ways. Could you ever see Vince McMahon doing a tell all type book? Um, sure. No way. That would never happen. Yeah, yeah I, I could see it. Mike Whitaker wants to know when Vince was doing the McMahon million dollar giveaway, was he really giving away his money? 100%. Couldn't, uh, you know, pu the company's a public company. He couldn't give away company money to do something like that. So it was, it was his own money. Uh, you know, I don't know what you want to say here, but there's a whole bunch of smart asses in the replies, uh, with their stupid smirks. Let's say, why are the ratings worse than they've been in 20 years? Do you want to say anything or just keep it fucking moving? Ah, keep it moving. Uh, on a serious for those note, that, for those that know, no explanation is needed for those that don't, none will do. Lenny Bakken wants to know with Vince being such a workout freak, 
Has he ever encouraged or even insisted that his inner circle work out with him as well? Uh, not insisted. It's, uh, especially not with him. I used to work out with him all the time. Uh, but no, it wasn't never really been insisted. It just happened to be right place, right time. Um, encouraged yes to work out could you imagine having such a crazy story in your childhood like when you hear people say i met the rock at a waffle house once or i went to hulk hogan's beat shop you get to reply with oh yeah i played video games with vince mcmahon and i whipped his ass next up it's vince mcmahon versus the courts I know Conrad has said they will never do a Vince McMahon episode. He and Bruce have done an episode about the steroid trial from 1994. And this is a fun compilation of the times McMahon has gotten litigious. Let's talk about uh, another story that's pretty big. It's a little bit off the beaten path. I don't know how much information you'll even have about it, but it's such a wild story. There's a report on the November 22nd New York Post that said federal prosecutors were investigating whether or not there was witness tampering and obstructed justice in the trial of Vince McMahon in July 94, the Brooklyn office reported as investigating television producer, Marty Bergman and his wife, Laura Brevetti, who was the lead defense attorney in McMahon's trial on the allegation that Bergman offered a key witness in the trial between 250 and $400,000, according to some government documents. Emily Feinberg, who was McMahon's former administrative assistant, was the government's key witness and told investigators about Bergman's offer. The FBI agents and an assistant U.S. attorney were interviewing witnesses regarding Bergman's conduct before the trial, and the investigation is said to determine whether Bergman pursued witnesses and potential witnesses against McMahon in an effort to change, taint, or discredit their testimony by inducing them to accept money as television consultants. What a weird thing. Uh, leading to the trial, Bergman represented himself as a producer for 60 Minutes, Hard Copy, A Current Affair, and American Journal, while withholding that at the time he was living with Brevetti and working out of her office. A lot to unpack here. Um, most of this is not something a lot of our listeners are even interested in. But we know how the trial is going to wind up. Vince is going to ultimately be acquitted, but it feels like we're not done. We're still coming after different angles here. And this time the allegation is witness tampering. My goodness. It, it absolutely silly because the U S government didn't have a case. It spent millions upon millions of dollars trying to trump up a case uh, without even putting on a defense. Vince and, and Titan sports won uh, in a jury trial. And again, the government's case was so poor that no defense was even needed. And it was a horrible waste of time, a horrible waste of money. And when you really dig into the government's behavior in this entire investigation, it's, it's sad and it's, it's, pretty shameful when you honestly look at it, um, as far as, you know, witness tampering, um, with whatever Feinberg, um, they were questioned and cross-examined in the federal trial. Why didn't that come out then? Why didn't, why didn't she come forward with that then? Or the government, if they knew this was happening, why didn't they come forward with it then? that's, it's just, um, trumped up and, and silly when you, when you look at it, because then it shines a light on the ineptness and the lack of case that the government actually had. In your opinion, is this, you know, just the prosecutors still sore that they lost what I'm sure once upon a time they felt like it was a slam dunk case. Now they're just They've got an ax to grind. Yes, I do. And I, I mean, I, I can tell you from personal experience that the way that they actually treated me and how, the, and how they did it and the timing of, of what they did to me 
and trying to get me to testify against Vince and, and trying to tell me what to say and doing it while my dad was in intensive care with his chest wide open. Um, the timing, it just was, it was an ugly, ugly ordeal. It was an ugly time in all of our lives. We lived through it and prevailed and are stronger on the other side because of it. And there are people that will never, ever know the lengths that the prosecutors and the government went to to try to, to, to make a name for themselves. And I, the New York Post as well. It was an axe to grind. What can you tell us about Laura Brevetti? It's not a name we've talked about a lot, but we have heard a few times here on the show. Uh, Laura was Vince's, uh, I believe she was the company attorney, or I, I actually, she was either the company's attorney or Vince's personal attorney, one of the two. Uh, she was a tremendous attorney and a super, super nice lady. Uh, if I was, you know, <laughs> if I needed an attorney, she'd be on the short list. Um, let's talk about something else that stood out in my research here. Vince McMahon attended house shows here in Cincinnati, Columbus, and the Meadowlands. And, uh, I think Meltzer would say he usually only attended Madison square garden. Any ideas why Vince showed up to the house show? Is this one of those moments where he calls the click or the click calls him and he comes in or is he just doing a pop in or was it planned that he would make the loop to see maybe what he could do to improve it. And so Meltzer was doing Vince's, uh, personal calendar at this time. So he knows that the only shows Vince only attends are Madison square garden. So he normally, he was normally on the house show loop. I didn't know that. He went to a lot of house shows. I mean, I, I legitimately didn't know that. I'm not no, being I, a smart ass. Yes, he did. I mean, it, it's, he's a businessman. He goes out to, to view the product and see how everything's going. So yeah, Vince went to quite a few live events. So well, that's, it's nothing unusual. It just happened to be whatever, uh, liar, I mean, stooge or whatever, uh, fan might've seen Vince McMahon that was bought a ticket for the, uh, mezzanine section and saw Vince watching the matches and called Dave Meltzer and said, Oh my God, Vince isn't it. This, he's here and it's not Madison square garden. And they made a lie. I mean, a story out of it. Help me understand. Talk to me a little bit about when that Indianapolis meeting happened, you know, it's, we haven't touched on it a lot, but it does feel like something that we should mention because in this era, we've got Hunter coming in, but it's not going to be too long. Sean and razor are going to be out. Is this still sort of the, the click era? Does it feel like they've got Vince's ear and whether it's true or not, there is perceived heat amongst the boys. Well, I think that this was definitely during a time that there was, you know, the click and those guys running together and, and hanging out together. Um, yeah, definitely. This was during that time. I just assumed that that, that meeting in Indianapolis had to happen sometime in 95. I have no, I, I have absolutely no idea. And again, that's, you know, for, for Vince to go to live events not unusual. And there were times where we would go in early to TV and we would hit live events. It, what's Vince business. What's Vince looking for when he visits a live event? How is it different from a traditional live event? Are people just minding their P's and Q's a little more? Does he hold a meeting to rally the troops? Does he sit in the back? Does he try to hide in the stands? What's the no, he goes in and, t and does business. He goes in and talks to talent. He goes in and watches the show, wanting to see how, you know, when the only thing that you see is the television product and you're not able to go out and see the live events that you're selling off of that television product, there was a difference in the presentation. You don't have all the bells and whistles that you have at television. So you want to go and look at what you're presenting to that audience that's buying tickets for it and see, well, shit, what can we do better to deliver a better product to the live events? How can we make this experience closer to what we're presenting to them on TV? And that's all you, you go out and just try to make everything better as best you can. 
Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. Let's talk about something else that really caught my attention. WWF president, Linda McMahon sent out a business statement on July 11th, stressing a need to constantly adapt to marketplace changes, talking about going direct merchandising through online services and that licensing and international television deals have exceeded projections and that the first in your house exceeded internal projections in regard to the changes. McMahon wrote quote, we are moving forward but we must consolidate and streamline some areas and change the management systems in order to operate efficiently. Some positions will be lost and the transition phase will require everyone's cooperation. When additions are necessary for growth, they will be added. So this is basically her saying we got to become more efficient. And that means some of you got to go, uh, with the hope that, Hey, when business picks up, you can come back. Do you think when those three names in particular that we mentioned, Steve Rex and skip, do you think they left thinking, Hey, maybe there's a chance to come back when business turns around or was this a see you later? Although that means never. Um, I think actually Steve came back at some point. I thought so, because I remember seeing his name. It feels like later in the nineties. Yeah. But, um, I think that they all thought that there's a possibility of coming back, but no promise. Is this the era where you've joked about, or it's been joked about that Vince even removed the water coolers from headquarters? Uh, I think this was about that time. You know, that, that seems to be much, uh, bigger news to people like Dave Meltzer and Eric Bischoff that, that love to talk about. They even took the water coolers out. What year was it? You've told me before, I don't even think we were recording a show. We were just talking in real life about sort of the ebbs of WWF business and how sometimes it's great. And sometimes it's not Vince don't sell shit for nobody, blah, blah, blah. But there was a moment of frustration you told me about once where you said, I had to pull f- whatever number of millions out of my ass. When that was, was that? I mean, that was right in this time. And it was, it T- was tell just, the story for our listeners who've he, never heard it. Well, but people think that, that Vince is this, this horrible, horrible human being that, um, his middle name is Beelzebub and that he just didn't care about people, didn't care about anything but the bottom line. And it it was during a time we were not a publicly held company and Vince and Linda privately held that company. And when the company is losing money, um, Vince was, was taking out of his own pocket while losing millions of dollars and would make sure that everyone was paid each pay period out of his own ass, out of his own side, you know, um, privately funding that. But his thing was, he wasn't going to miss a payday for people, um, because he had too many people that were depending on him. And that was a level of frustration that he just had to keep putting back into the company instead of just folding up shop and saying, okay, shit, we're losing too much money. Um, I think Vince would have put every single penny he had in the company and, and mortgaged everything he owned and found ways to get loans to do it. But Vince didn't want to do that. Didn't want to uh, mortgage everything to the hilt and borrow a bunch of money. He wanted to make sure that he did it himself. So yeah, the money came out of his ass and the money came out of, uh, came from him specifically. So yeah, it was, it was a major, major frustration. It's so remarkable. I mean, when you really think about it, imagine for a minute, if Vince had said, okay, my financial advisors and and all the people who helped me manage my personal wealth have said that, you know, this is not good for me. And my, I've had a conversation with my wife and she's agreed that we need to just, uh, take our purse and go home. 
because they had built a, a, a mass and incredible personal wealth, but now the business is losing money. And so Vince is pulling money out of his own personal coffers, out of his personal investments and funding the company with it because it's literally losing cash. And I think a lot of, he probably could have gotten some advice from different folks to say, yes, you could cut X, Y, and Z, and maybe that would make it more palatable. But Vince with this large sum of wealth you've accumulated for yourself. Why are you fooling with this? Why don't you just go rest on your laurels a little bit and come up with a new idea in a few years, take a few years off and wrestling by and large would have been different forever. And I don't know that it would exist the way it does now had Vince not dug into his personal coffers, because it's not like WCW at this point was exactly innovating. No. And, but Vince had faith and what the hell, you know, he wanted to do, knew that he could do it. So and passion for wrestling. I mean, I know that sometimes wrestling fans online will say, oh, Vince hates wrestling. Clearly he doesn't hate the wrestling business because if you, if you hated the wrestling business, this is your excuse to leave. It's losing money. Wash your hands of it. It's no longer a cash cow, but to throw your own cash behind it tells me he has a passion for this. Well, he, without a doubt, I don't, he wouldn't be in it all this time if he didn't. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. Uh, in February 8th, McMahon would file a complaint with the pre-merger notification office of the FTC's Bureau of Competition. The exact details of the complaint were not available as of press time, but the FTC claimed to not have a copy of it. But McMahon has been trying to get the word out about his complaints. He claimed it wasn't any single action that was so bad on the surface to warrant the complaint, but it was the combination of different actions. Among them is WCW putting Nitro up against Raw, State, uh, starting the show a few minutes early and ending it a few minutes late, which he called unprecedented in television. He also alleges contract tampering with his performers, gaining syndicated time slots. In some cases that the WBF would have gotten using the leverage of CNN headline news to put together deals or spending more money to buy time, attempting to drive television advertising rates down by charging less for ad time than the WWF would. And even the name calling on television. And of course, all the silliness on the 900 hotline. I got to tell you in hindsight, this lawsuit from Vince feels a little bit like sour grapes. I mean, he, everything he's suing for here, he did to the territory guys before him, right? Well, when a lawsuit, it was just a complaint. <laughs> well, that's fair. I agree right? with that. So you can complain about shit all you want. I want to file a formal complaint. They're fucking with my business and I don't like it. Yes. It's not illegal. I just don't like it. And I need people to hey, know some of it was contract tampering was illegal. I'm not arguing that, but the other shit is like, come on, man. Well, I didn't like it. I understand. In the WBS period of expansion, it also brought out ex existing established television time slots from regional promoters. It also rated the best drawing talent of regional offices with the lure of them being able to earn a better income and, uh, went back into the region with those same headliners. In the case of the AWA in particular, McMahon systematically picked off a large percentage of the key headline talent, both in the ring and behind the scenes. One by one, McMahon practically drove Crockett out of business by putting the first survivor series on pay-per-view on the date Crockett had already booked for his first Starcade pay-per-view in 87. And of course, virtually every cable company in the country went with McMahon and Crockett ran a pay-per-view that he expected to be a major cash windfall that ended up costing him money. So he continues to detail some of these circumstances, but this awfully feels like, I mean, it feels a lot like Vince getting a taste of his own medicine to me. Are you able to see that from the outside at all? Or are you just kind of sort of toe the line here? No, I, I think that, you know, look, when you go back and look at the history of everything that took place, I think that a lot of the things that Bischoff did, um, were smart. Did he tamper with contracts? Yes. Uh, was that illegal? Yes. Um, doing everything else was out of the box and extraordinary and things that, you know, uh, had never been done before. So 
it's like, well, wait a minute. Um, they can do this. Well, they could do it because their boss owned the fucking network that they were on. So they could come in early. They could go off late. We didn't have that luxury because we didn't own USA. Um, so yeah, it, it was, it was different things that, and the comparison is, is not necessarily fair. It was a completely different deal. And, but at the same time, I guess, you know, when you look at the offers that Eric was making and oftentimes get misconstrued, it was, Eric wasn't offering these huge money, uh, offers, Uh, He was offering good money, but a different work schedule and allowing guys to have a completely different, you know, they didn't have to have to work four or five times a week. They came and did TV for a lot of them. That's all they did. So he was offering them something different and an alternative to what they were already doing. Um, Again, you, you look at it and it was, it was different business and it was, they were coming from a place where they had no ad revenue. So, uh, going in and being able to sell their ad uh, ad revenue for less didn't hurt them because they didn't have any to begin with. So it, it hurt us because all of a sudden it's, they're selling it for pennies on the dollar and, um, yeah, shit happens. But uh, how are they? How are they doing business wise now? WCW. Yeah. I mean, I think they're making a comeback. Okay. Cool. That's what I heard. All right. Let's uh, let's keep it going here. Meltzer would say, when it comes to television ad rates, WCW officials have claimed that their ads for the entire network for a thirty second spot are nineteen thousand, while the WBFs are fifteen thousand, claiming it's actually the WBF undercutting them. McMahon lists figures of 25,000 for WWF and 18,000 for WCW. Since McMahon's shows deliver a small audience and yet he's charging more, he's made the claim they're undercutting him. According to a third party buyer, the figure McMahon has claimed would be accurate. Uh, do you remember what ad rates were back in 87? We're talking about what they are here. And <laughs> no, I'm just saying when you're in no, the WWF, I don't, I, I, again, I didn't deal in that. I didn't, I had, I had no clue at all. We ain't got to get hot about it. I'm just I'm saying, not half hot. It feels already, like already here. We start off fucking nice. It's early in the morning. I'm all refreshed. I had a bowl of cereal and now you're already pissing me off. Okay. For the most recent ratings weekend, which will be the week ending January 28th, WCW was on 177 stations and the various cable networks reach a total of 6.7 million homes. The WBF has 161 stations and USA would hit 4.77 million homes. So the biggest possible rating for WCW there is a 7.1 compared to a 5.0, uh, for the WWF. How important was syndication here in 1996? It feels like less than in years past in 96, a lot less than it wasn't. It was different, and it depended upon which book you wanted to, to look at, whether you wanted to look at Arbitron or you wanted to look at uh, another book. All that shit could be twisted and turned and and made. <laughs> I was going through some of Paul Bosch's stuff the other day and found some uh, what I call JR math. Of He would just take the highest ratings – in certain markets and combine them and, and then put that out as a press release. Oh my God, look at this great rating leaving out, you know, the, the hash marks in yeah. major markets like LA and Chicago and different things like that. And again, it's nothing more than marketing. Um, so, so much of that was. So he showed you guys show up to the building that day and what happens? Um, Jeff went in and met with Vince and then, uh, met with Jr. and they, either they got him a check that day for whatever it was that he wanted. And he went out he did the match of China, put her over like a million bucks and left. And I remember, you know, Jeff coming up and by this time, you know, Jeff and I had really gotten over all of our stuff and we were cool. And I remember him coming up and he said goodbye to every single person in the building that night. And 
Jeff's version, I shouldn't speak for him. The version I've heard that is that Jeff just wanted what was owed to him. And that sometimes some pay-per-view residuals and some house show checks and all that would kind of trail. And he was concerned that if he went and showed up on WCW TV, given the circumstance and the Monday night war and all that, that some of that money would have been even slower to come if it ever came at all. So he just wanted whatever he had already earned in one lump sum that night. Is that to the best of your understanding the way it went down? That's the best of my understanding. Yeah. From, from Jeff's side. Yes. And, and frankly, I don't, I don't disagree with that. You know what I mean? I don't disagree with him wanting that. I I, I don't disagree with it either. I just think it's funny that the net, that the narrative gets pushed out there, um, that he held Vince up for a bunch of money. He didn't hold him up for a bunch of money. He wanted what he had earned. But again, at the time it was, he held Vince up and he he wasn't going to go out until he got his money. And at the time, you know, it all, it all got put on Jr. and it is not, you know, hundred percent, man. It's that one can't be put on Jr. Uh, that one was Vince, you know, trying, trying to salvage something and make it all work again. Um, anything else you want to tell me about this? I feel like you're not sure. No, I I mean, really? See, you want more. That's it. That's the story that there's nothing more to it. That's that's all there is. Jeff came in and it wasn't like a big screaming match. It wasn't a fuck you. Fuck you. It was, you know, I'm here. I'm here to do my job. I want my money. I'd like for Jr. to give it to me. They met, he got it. He went out and did his job. No, no other drama other than that. So there wasn't any. Vince was not blowing a gasket backstage. No. Nope. China wins the Intercontinental title from the departing Jeff Jarrett in eight and a half minutes. This is a good housekeeping match, which is essentially a street fight with household appliances. They advertise Deborah as being in China's corner, but of course, Deborah's never actually here. Um, lots of silly, you know, weapons here, a toilet seat, a garbage can. She stuffed a banana in his mouth. She jumps off the apron through a table. Um, Jarrett whips China with a fish. Lawler starts to make all sorts of fish smell jokes. Um, there's milk, flour, and eggs. Lots of silliness. Low blows and such. The match is stopped and started. Finally, we get it. Uh, China cracks him with a guitar shot uh, for the pin. And I guess that's technically not a household appliance, but it'll count. Uh, since Jared's leaving, Miss Kitty is now with China, and the match gets three and a quarter stars. After the match, the rumor and innuendo is Jared walked right out to his car, even with all that shit on him, and left the building. 100% completely false. Jared went back to the dressing room, took a shower, got dressed, and walked through and thanked everybody and said goodbye to everyone. So you felt like he couldn't have handled that much better. After the fact, he was, no, he was fine. Uh, he debuted on Nitro the very next night by running into the ring and hitting Buff Bagwell in the head with a guitar, and he had a pretty successful run that time in WCW. He won the world title four times, the U.S. title three times, and we all know the story about Vince buying WCW in 2001. It's that famous simulcast on March 26th, and um, Jeff had just been on TV on Nitro and said, as far as... The Jeff, Vince now says, as far as the Jeff Jarrett's of the world are concerned, you know how Jeff spells his name. That's J-E-F-F. Well, you know what? I would suspect that it might be spelled a different way after tonight. That would be G-O-O-N-E-E gone. Um, so, you were there. Chat me up. Was this a shoot? Was was Was... Jeff kind of persona non grata with the company at that point. Why did he never get another opportunity? Well, I was there. I was in Panama city. I I was actually there with Jeff watching that promo for the first time with Jeff. Right. I had no idea that Vince was going to cut that promo. Sure. At all. Jeff laughed about it and nothing more was really said. We said goodbye at the end of the night, but Jeff was never hired to be fired. It was Vince cutting a spot for a television show. Um, but 
I don't think that there was any interest in bringing Jeff in beyond that. And he still had time on his contract to write out and he got his money from AOL. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. All right, boys and girls, that's going to do it. And, uh, you know how the story ends with Jeff and the WWF, uh, depending on who you believe there was a stick up, it was a hold up. Uh, but you just heard Bruce's take on it. We also addressed what Jr. said, but if you want to hear what old double J has to say about it, you're going to have to tune in to episode number one of my world. Can you think of a better episode to kick things off than the famous you held up Vince McMahon story? I just, I, I, what I, I, and I, I guess I've forgotten, but I can't, was it a 38 or 45? What? And, and, and (laughs) if I do my right research and we get into it and, and maybe it's a snub nose, I I don't know. Or, or sometimes the story gets twisted and, and the actual me holding him up is that when I ask him for that high seven figure number, not six figure high seven figure number. He passed out. I literally had to hold him up. So <laughs> I can't wait to get into all of it in my world. Cause we're going to dig deep. Um, and you know, Vince is, you know, he's a big heavy man and holding, uh, you know, dead weight up like that is tough. Uh, especially with two thirty eights in my pocket. So, uh, we'll get into all of it, brother. I cannot wait. <laughs> I'm excited. This was fun today. I appreciate everybody coming along for this fun ride to talk about Jeff Jarrett and WWE and I can't wait to do this on a weekly basis with you. It's Tuesdays on Westwood one, starting May 4th. You can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere you enjoy your podcast. Our teaser trailer is already up right now. You can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, Jeff, your social handles just about everywhere are real Jeff Jarrett, right? It's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the website just blasted off this past Monday when we did the announcement on the, on the raw after mania. Uh, kudos to your entire team, man. It is everywhere in the press tour that's lined up. I got one for the UK. I got one for Australia and I've got one here for, uh, us, Canada and Latin America. So, um, man, it's, um, it is going to be a busy, busy, busy. And may the fourth be with us. May the fourth. Here it comes. By the way, follow us on Twitter. It's at my world podcast. And by the way, you can get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. You can also get a free zoom event that Jeff and I just recently did. And we told some fascinating stories about merchandise and the six sided ring and getting into Walmart. And yes, we even addressed some old school Memphis stuff. Uh, some of our listeners, That's gonna be fun. yeah, I, I don't think everybody listening to this knows that your grandmother started promoting wrestling or she got in the wrestling business in the forties. Is that right? 1946 took a second job selling wrestling tickets and the rest is history. It's really fascinating. When I think back on, on, uh, and, and, and just think about that. I mean, let alone in the seventies or eighties, but in the fifties and sixties, a woman in the professional wrestling industry and not just, I mean, in, in the office, quote unquote, in the office, it's uh, it's really fascinating. It, it really, really is. Uh, but anyhow, can't wait to get into all of it. From Memphis to Texas to Puerto Rico to Japan and WWF, WCW, TNA, and on and on. You know, I've joked with you off air. If uh, if cats have nine lives, somehow Jeff Jarrett has ten. How, how how I don't understand how you're still doing this, man. I'm just fascinated by your story. I think it's the most interesting story, maybe the most interesting story in all of wrestling because there's so many ups and downs and peaks and valleys. And you just find a way to come out better than you started every single time. Is it just the power of positive thinking or, or you just have a golden horseshoe up your ass? What's the secret here? <laughs> Conrad, I must say this, the call that I had about, so it is uh, about 24 hours ago, the best is yet to come. There's a lot of, I've got some things I'm working on. Um, but you know what? And I, I will say this. I, I, I do believe that not just, uh, positive attitude what good but and and how you've talked me into this and i've enjoyed 
we've only really gotten into it, but I've never looked in the rearview mirror. I've learned from things, but I've never been to one to, even in the dressing room and guys telling old stories and, you know, old timers. Um, and now I guess I am an old timer at my age, but you know, that, that was what they did around the dressing room. And it used to drive me absolutely bananas when they would tell the same story over and over and over and over. And I remember being in dressing rooms with Bobby Jaggers and Kurt Henning and, and Kurt telling these, like, if I hear this one story again from Jaggers, I'm going to go nuts. But anyway, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm digressing here, but, but I've always really thought forward and innovative and, and I, I guess sort of my default thing, uh, and I've carried this with me, uh, you know, the quote about it's not the credit that counts, the people that are on the outside that want to criticize or, or take credit or whatever. I've, I've never been about that. I like to get in the arena, get my hands dirty. I get that from my grandmother and my father that roll up your sleeve, son, get in there, do what you're going to do. And I've always never been really, I've been fearless in, so what if it fails? Try again. Yeah. I mean, literally try again. And and I do think we touched this on the Zoom call, ad free. And man, what a bargain that is! I couldn't believe. But anyway, the 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 Memphis territory of doing a TV every Saturday morning, and then you go down to the arena on Monday night, and you find out if you were a success or a failure. But knowing no matter how good it was or how bad it was, you're getting back up to bat again Saturday morning. I think that ingrained in me from a business perspective, specifically in professional wrestling splash sports entertainment, that you're only as good as your last angle or promo or show, whatever it may be. I think that has ingrained perseverance into me. Well, we hope that you guys will persevere and we appreciate (laughs) you persevering through this four plus hour podcast. It was fun to revisit all things. Jeff Jarrett, you're going to get them every Tuesday for free on Westwood one. Uh, it's called my world with Jeff Jarrett, go subscribe anywhere you enjoy podcasts. And again, you can get all those shows early and ad free for just nine bucks a month over at adfreeshows.com. And by the way, you don't just get Jeff's for early and ad free. You get Eric Bischoff, you get Tony Schiavone, you get Jim Ross, you get Arn Anderson, you get Kurt Angle, you get where I'm going. It's a ton of content every single week at adfreeshows.com. Until next time, he is at Real Jeff Jarrett. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad, and we are out of time. We hope to be back next week with Mr. Bruce Pritchard on something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Ain't we great? <laughs> <laughs> See you soon. It sure is good to hear good old Double J doing wrestling talk style content. By the way, be sure to give him a follow over at My World with Jeff Jarrett. And we're going to move on to Vince McMahon versus Top Guys. And it's no secret the way to become and stay a tippy top guy is to have a relationship with the man himself. So the next clip is all about how the headliners have fought to maintain that relationship with Vince. I don't mean for this to sound weird. And I know that some of our listeners are going to have fun with the way I'm phrasing this. But it's been said once upon a time that in order for you to be really a top guy, the top guy, Vince has to sort of fall in love with you. And I think when you look at the statement you made a minute ago of, well, the idea was how do we get all the belts on diesel and Sean? It feels like Vince is in love with diesel and Sean at this point. Is that fair to say? I don't know if he was or not, but that wasn't Vince's idea. That was our idea. Our idea was to get everything on them to then blow them up. That was that was the the impetus of this whole thing where Pat and I are talking about like, okay, let's load them up so that you think these guys are impenetrable and you can't is that even a fucking word? It is now, you know. Okay. Impenetrable, yeah, that. They're they're on top of the world. And and then blow it up. So that was the you know, as you're going into this shit and we're doing this and everything's happening so damn fast that okay let, let's do this let's go here and then obviously shit changed as, as we got into it but um no it wasn't even vince's idea vince was like what the fuck do you do with it and his his first thought was goddamn they can't be tag team champions which again we'll we'll get there talk to me about you know my 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 freestyle that maybe Vince has to be in love with you to be the top guy. Like I know that certainly he rode Hulk Hogan to the promised land. And you know, then, uh, the Shawn Michaels run is really the one I think of next, because it does feel like whenever Vince is on commentary, he's really selling it. And we've heard for a long time that 
Vince had a different relationship with Sean where it was maybe different than the relationship he had with Brett or Hogan. And, you know, obviously, you know, he's going to have a, a really tight relationship for a while with, with Steve Austin, a very much open door and a different type relationship again than what he had with Sean. But we hear that he had that with John Cena as well. Is there some sort of, Hey, when we're going to give you the ball, when we're going to make you the champ, when I'm going to sort of put my company on your shoulders, we're going to get a lot closer here. We're going to, we're going to be on the same page about what we're doing. Cause we're, we're not doing it, you know, any other way than together. Well, that's accurate, but, uh, you know, I think that a lot of it starts <laughs> most of the time. It'll start from a whole different, uh, relationship. I mean, it was Shawn Michaels wasn't Vince's favorite person in the beginning by any stretch of the imagination. You can go down the list of those talent, but when they get to that point, yeah, you got to have a strong relationship and a strong bond to be able to work together as, as closely as we all do. And Vince wants their input just as much as anything, because they're the guys out there carrying that ball and they're the ones that are putting the company on their back. So yeah, the, but that relationship is built over time. It's not like, God damn, I love you. And I'm going to make you champion. Oh no, no, I don't, I didn't it, mean it's, it's I'm going to make you, we're going to, we're going to put this on you and we're going to get through it together. And ho and if a bond builds and a bond builds, sometimes the bond doesn't build. Yeah. I didn't mean to insinuate that, you know, these guys are holding hands and writing love notes and doing, doing picnics. I was trying to not insinuate that. I, I just mean in terms of, Hey, this is our guy. Let's give him yeah. every opportunity we can. We're going to do everything we can to sort of put the franchise on him. And it feels like at different times he's done that with Roman Reigns or he's done that with John Cena. Certainly he did it with Stone Cold and he did it with Shawn Michaels and he tried to do it with Brett and he did it with Hogan. And this just feels like right now, for whatever reason, in 1995, man, it's all about Shawn Michaels and Kevin Nash. Yeah, and they they were the guys that he he was looking to and and, and putting the show, the company on their shoulders. How so much, yeah, that bond was developing during this time. Is Vince, um, when he talks about Sean and diesel in this era, uh, does he, does he believe that Sean is the best wrestler in the world? And diesel is sort of the airport guy, like, God damn, look how big he is. And he's quote unquote natural. He's not this gassed out of his mind guy that maybe people would raise an eyebrow about just a couple of years prior. I think the argument could be said on, on, on both of them. Uh, Cause yeah, Kevin Nash was that guy to this day, Kevin Nash walks into a room. He's damn near seven feet tall and Jack looks up. like a fucking, it looks like a fucking matinee idol. And even now he's you know, gray hair and his debonair does the damn, you know, uh, stroking the goatee and all that shit. Um, Cause he has a quote weak chin, but, <laughs> um, you know, yeah, they, they were a package and Sean, just the way Sean strutted around everywhere. Sean Michaels looked like he was somebody. So they lived it to the hilt and, and yeah, Kevin Nash was the kind of guy when you look at him, especially during this time, he stood out. I mean, you could pick him out of a crowd and he was somebody that we were looking to get behind and move up that ladder. Adam wants to know, has Bruce ever sneezed in front of Vince? Oh yeah. And you know how I sneeze. Oh, oh my God. I don't know that the audience knows that, but Bruce sneezing is a fucking production. I mean, think about the loudest. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like a, a an attack scene in Jurassic park, loud and violent. I mean, he's putting on a production. You think this can't be real, but it happens not once but multiple times. Yeah. And, and when I sneeze, I sneeze a minimum of eight to nine times. Yeah. It's where you think like he's stuck. You know how you've had like a CD that skips. Well, he'll do it. I sneeze in threes. I don't know why that is, but we've counted and Bruce is always either eight or nine. He, he's never sneezed once in his life. No. So when that happens, does, does Vince have a fucking aneurysm? 
No, he puts the shield down. Oh God. So he just holds up like a, a notebook and no, he has an invisible shield. He pulls down. If this were video, you would see me with my index finger and thumb holding it up in front of my face and acting like I'm pulling a string down. He legitimately pretends like he has an invisible shield. Yeah. It doesn't but, pretend he's got an invisible shield. He's Vince McMahon. You don't know. That's the best. So there's a pro wants to know, does Vince know about your Vince isms like chocolate titties? And if so, what does he say? I don't know if he knows about chocolate titties, but he definitely knows about all the others. But yeah. I mean, as you do, I do him to him. Sure. I mean, if, if I'm especially when I used to produce Vince a lot, I, uh, I would do his part as if he would do it with his voice, his mannerisms, everything. D writes, we all know Vince is a workaholic and loves it, but other than working out, what does Vince enjoy doing whenever he has quote unquote free time? Does he have any hobbies? Does he have a favorite TV show or movie that you know of? Um, Hmm. Well, as far as TV shows. Yeah. I, right now, what the hell is he watching right now? He's, he's found Deadwood, So he loves Deadwood. Um, it, it depends, you know, really depends on, on what he has time to, to do. There's not a whole lot of free time. I know he enjoys going to the gym. Does that count? You know, I, I know that, um, he, I mean, you told us he likes Deadwood, but what's his favorite longest running weekly episodic television show in history? Monday Night Raw. Well, let's talk about, uh, what comes up. And it's the pretty controversial interview on HBO. Um, it's a pretty big deal when this comes out because Piper's technically under contract and they're airing a, a pretty controversial interview where he's sort of blaming the wrestling business for a lot of situations and drugs and substance issues that guys have. And then he finds out that he's been let go online. What do you remember about this HBO interview and the decision to let him go? Well, he was not let go online. He was, he was definitely called and told that, you know, they were letting him go. Um, the interview was done beforehand. Roddy had told us about the interview. However, he had also told us that he, you know, didn't say anything bad that he only talked about himself and the way that it was framed in the documentary and the way that it was framed didn't come across good for Roddy and or for the company and Vince didn't want to be associated with it. So he cut ties. Um, he felt that Roddy could have prepared us a lot more for what, for everything that he said. And when Roddy had told us about what he had said in the interview, he didn't bring up the things that they played. And maybe he forgot, I don't know, and I, and I really and truly don't believe that Roddy purposely kept things from us. I just think that the way that the interview was edited and the way that it aired didn't look good, and it didn't portray Roddy well, didn't portray the company well, and Vince didn't feel that it was a good look for the company, so he parted ways. Piper has admitted that he was difficult to do business with, and... Huh. Uh, you know, Dave Meltzer even wrote, quote, he had made demands of Vince McMahon that nobody else would dare do, and he got away with it. What type of relationship did Piper and McMahon have where he could sort of get away with stuff that maybe others couldn't? Roddy and Vince had a love-hate relationship, and, you know, they both needed each other, especially in the early years. And I think that Vince enjoyed the back and forth with Roddy, because it was always a chess game. <laughs> this is surreal. <laughs> and Roddy could be difficult to deal with, but I always go back to as long as you know what the hell you're dealing with and you know how to deal with it, you know, you can work your way through the minefield. And Vince used me for a lot of that. Roddy and I were friends, but he also respected me and he 
I could get Roddy to do things that Vince couldn't get him to do by asking him in a different way. And if, if it was coming, if I could look at Roddy and say, Roddy, this is coming from me. And especially in later years when he knew that, okay, like with, with the SmackDown stuff, I know this is coming from Bruce. And I had a lot of input from Roddy ahead of time. I would get his input beforehand. And he felt that I was working with him and thought that, okay, if it's coming from Bruce, I'm, I, he gave me a lot more leeway than he did other people. And I, you know, I, I enjoyed that and I didn't abuse it. Um, I shot straight with him and in return, he shot straight with me. Be happy with Jim in this regard and encourages him to ride with Vince McMahon. He says, Hey, come ride with me. Listen, that you've talked about this on the show before, but you're taking, you're, you're taking a major risk to ride shotgun with Vince McMahon in the mid nineties. Are you not? Yes. Yes. Because he's, he's, it's like John Candy in the damn planes, trains, and automobiles. He just becomes the devil. He likes to drive quickly as we say. <laughs> All right. Very quickly. I'm going to read what, what, what Jim wrote. And then I want you to sort of reenact it as Vince McMahon. Are you ready? Sure. Beside me, this is all while they're driving. Vince is driving beside me. Vince was singing at the top of his lungs, punching 90 miles an hour on a secondary road, all while quote unquote dancing in his seat. I'm an amazing dancer for a white man. He shouted over the music. I'm an amazing dancer for a white man. <laughs> yeah. Well, he is. He's a great dancer. He's a good dancer. Oh my god, that is the funniest fucking thing ever. I'm an amazing. By the way, by the way, so am I. I'm a very good dancer. Yeah, good singer too. But... Spend my days working hard on the go, but the hands on the clock keep spinning too slow. I can't wait to be alone with my baby tonight. I ain't. And that's with hillbilly teeth in, motherfucker. So, Nothing against hillbillies. It's just my fucking teeth are all fucked up. These traveling with Vince stories are the highlight of Jim's book, Slobber Knocker, which is available now on Amazon, by the way. And I think his new book, Under the Black Hat, is available for pre order, too. And it's like uh, top of the chart. So check out Slobber Knocker and Under the Black Hat, which comes out next year around WrestleMania time. Imagine that. Uh, so another great Vince story. I thought I heard something in the trunk. My first thought was. They've put longtime employee Howard Finkel in the trunk as a rib. Is it the car? I asked. Jesus Christ. Listen, will you? Vince growled. I closed my eyes and listened as hard as I've ever listened to anything in my life. Here it is, he said. And he began to fart. Long, bass filled flatulence that eventually finished with a smile of pride from the chairman. You hear it now? He asked. As he cackled with laughter. I made a split decision not to sell it in any way. I sat facing forward like nothing had happened. And Vince was so happy with himself. You know how I get the longevity and smell, Jim? Protein. I ate nothing but fucking protein, pal. Yeah, it wasn't that impressive, I said. Vince's head swiveled in my direction like I had just insulted his wife or something. What? He asked with a menace. He was serious, offended even. I couldn't back down now. It was a test. I was sure it was. Well, I've been around the business for over 20 years, Vince and Robert Gibson. Vince then locks the windows and lets another one go twice. The volume, twice the smell. He's watching my reaction intently as we continue to tear along the highway at speed and his creation was putrid. How about that one? Vince asked. He hated to be beaten at anything, even farting competitions. What a fucking great story. You got any good farting stories with Vince? No, but my favorite one, I probably, I do. They, they're putrid. Uh, but the, my favorite is when he would go to the bathroom in like the guests, like in the half bath in his house and then, uh, and then go, God damn it. I forgot my book in the bathroom. Would you, and he sent Jim Cornette in there to go get it. And Cornette went in and like, it's a half bath. It's a sink and a toilet. And Cornette actually looked around for a while. Vince, goddamn, I can't find your fucking book. But whoever the fucking took a shit in here and, you know, do shit like that. I do like to do that to my son all the time where I'll 
be taking care of business and I'll say, Kane, I need my phone. And he'll come. I can, I can hear him. I can hear him run down the stairs and find my phone, come running in our bathroom and go, Oh my God. Yeah. I learned that one from Vince. Stinky. Yeah. It's good stuff. He tells another story about riding along with him, uh, and being pulled over by an Ohio state trooper. Uh, you got to go out of your way to see the book slobber knocker to get that story. Uh, there's a really fun punchline there, but it's his story. So we'll leave that one. In the book. You know what, actually, and I, and I saw this the other day, someone sent it to me and, and his story is completely fucking wrong. All right. Well, tell his version. And I'm and going on, I'm going on fucking record to say his story's wrong. Okay. Cause I was in the goddamn car with Jerry Briscoe. I wasn't in the car with fucking Watts and Pat. Okay. So the, the story is, uh, McMahon's driving like a bat out of hell and the Ohio state trooper pulls him over. And Vince rolls down the window and says, we just finished producing our national television broadcast, Monday night, raw. I have Vince McMahon. And this here is good old Jr. beside me. The cop says, so you're Vince McMahon. I am Vincent Kennedy McMahon. And the cop says, well, I guess that makes me the big boss man then. And gives Vince a speeding ticket and says, have a good night. And you say, yeah, that's not the way that happened. Not, that's not, that's not, that's not the way it happened. All right. How'd it happen? We're going through construction and Vince is driving kind of erratically. Uh, I was in the car. It was Vince. I was Vince driving Jr. running shotgun. I was in the back seat. We needed more beer. So, well, okay. I needed more beer. So Jerry Briscoe goes, goes to the back and gets to Watts and Pat's car and he gets beer from there. Well, the traffic's moving like two miles an hour. You can't. So Jerry's running back and forth and bringing beer. So I'm taking the beer, but we're locking Jerry out. Well, he's on the outside of the car and the thing drives a little bit. And, um, we go on and Jerry and I were drinking quite a bit in the back seat. Um, it just, um, uh, goes on. So Vince is kind of hitting cones and they're rolling, trying to make them roll back into Watts car and things of that nature. But he's also driving in the construction area. And when construction ends, he takes off doing like 120 miles an hour. Well, the cop comes, pulls us over, takes Vince out of the car. Takes Vince, puts him in the back of his car. Comes back to us. Now, Vince did say the shit. You know, yes, officer, we were just down the street and uh, producing Monday Night Raw. Like he knows. I mean, like, what the fuck? Vince is dressed in his Monday Night Raw shit. JR's dressed in his Monday Night Raw shit. Who the fuck cares? And so the cop has Vince in the back. The cop comes back over on the passenger side. JR's in, in the front. Shines the light on JR. And he says, uh, Y'all been drinking tonight? JR says, uh, no, sir. I had a beer earlier, but not drinking tonight. He said, how about your, uh, driver? No, sir. He hasn't had anything to drink. He Vincent had nothing to drink. So then he comes to the back seat and he opens up the back door and he, he shines the light in the, in the car and he looks underneath and Jerry Briscoe had like a six pack, like it, it is feet. And the cop looks at that and says, one, two, three, four, five, six. He says, you drink all those beers? He said, yes, sir. And he says, how many beers have you had? He goes, he goes, just these right here. And he counts them and says, you drink all those? He says, yes, sir. He says, you realize I can give you a ticket for each one of those open containers, like $180 per open container. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Then he shines the light over to me. Well, underneath my legs, I had like three, six packs and now I didn't drink them all, but you know, I, I just went with what Jerry said. <laughs> Cop shines light over me. He says, how about you? You been drinking? Yes, sir. How much have you drank? I said, well, just these right here. And he goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, God damn it, son. That's just stupid. We're like, yes, sir, it's stupid, and you know, we're, we're sorry, but you know, we, we didn't do anything. So he comes back and he's talking to us, and he says, He says, Boys, I got over eight calls that there was some reckless driver driving through, tipping over cones, driving over 100 miles an hour coming down here. And uh, y'all down here, you're drinking and doing all this shit. 
And I'm like, yes, sir. You know, sorry, we just come back. He goes, so that really is Vince McMahon I got in the back of my car back there, isn't it? And we're like, well, yes, sir. It, it really is. That's just Vince McMahon. He goes, well, boys, I guess that makes me the big boss man tonight. <laughs> and all three of us were like, yes, sir. You sure sell art. Yes, sir. You're the big boss man. We're really sorry. He says, well, he passed the test. We're going to let him go. And, uh. Y'all need to pull over at the next stop and get rid of all this alcohol you got in here and uh, get on your way to your hotel and drive under the speed limit and let us go. But there were times when Vince would get pulled over and, and like, take the ticket and just <laughs> throw it in the back and take off. It's kind of kind of fun, but I was actually there for that one. Well, listen, we can't have a Vince McMahon show without talking Vince McMahon versus WCW. So from Vince Russo to Bret Hart, we got you covered. Russo wrote in his book, I feel so corny saying this, but I have to. Vince and I grew really close. At times, he almost felt like a father to me. I cared so much about him, his family, and his business, maybe as much as I cared about my own flesh and blood. I have my critics out there, but the fact remains that without me attached to his hip, Vince has never achieved the success he did during that time. So I want you to respond to both of those. Uh, I guess we'll start with the second part first. Is it fair for Vince to say that McMahon never experienced that same level of success without him? No, it's not. Uh, I would say when you go back to the early eighties and from 83 to 87 and during that time, Vince Russo was nowhere around and Vince McMahon was putting 93,000 people in stadiums. So there was no Vince Russo around there. And, and we continued to do good business up until the time that we didn't. So then during this time, yes, did absolutely phenomenal business, record breaking business during the time that Vince Russo was writing and he did help and he did contribute a great deal to that success since Vince Russo left. The company has never made more money than it did. And, you know, it's the company continues to grow every single year. And so that's that's a ludicrous statement, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Yes, he had tremendous success and deserves credit for that and a pat on the back. However, Vince achieved success before Vince Russo. Vince achieved success after Vince Russo. It's sort of interesting, the dynamic he breaks out in the book about the father-son relationship. He he talks about how Vince would sort of cave to the talent, and it would happen a lot of times in front of him, which really killed his credibility. So if Russo was really arguing for an idea, and the talent says that they didn't want to do it, then McMahon would just agree to it, even if the backup plan sort of stunk. And Russo felt like it killed his credibility. So he sets up a meeting to go sort of express all of this to McMahon. And he says, as I sat down in a chair across from Vince, I started crying like a baby. I couldn't stop. My emotions, whatever they were, came out in a river of tears. The expression on Vince's face, I don't think he knew what to say. Inside, however, he had to know that perhaps the pressure of our success was getting to me. And he needed to be strong and he knew that he needed to treat me with kid gloves. After I laid everything out, Vince said a few words and then ended his thoughts by saying, Vince, I love you. As soon as those words came out, I'm thinking two things. One, holy shit. This guy really does care about me. And two, is he kidding me or what? Why would he stoop so low and be so sappy to make me believe he really does care about me? I left Vince's office, not knowing if he had ever been sincere. That's a shame, but that's what the business has done to me. You're always second guessing. You're always doubting to this very moment. I don't know that Vince McMahon ever meant those words. I want to talk about just the dynamic because a lot of guys have this feeling about McMahon. He sort of referenced him as almost like a father figure to him earlier, but we've heard other people say this too, whether it's, you know, Shawn Michaels or, I mean, there's tons of guys and even the creative guys who sort of have this weird relationship with Vince and you maybe yourself at different times. What can you tell us about this father son dynamic that apparently Vince inspires with a lot of people? Vince does. And I've had the same 
relationship. I guess for me, it was more of a big brother because you know, I've got brothers that are older than Vince McMahon. So I, I looked at him as, as an older brother and somebody giving me advice. But he does have that father figure with a lot of guys that look up to him and, and want that encouragement, want that pat on the ass from Vince McMahon. You know, the fact that, that Russo looks at everything as cynically as he does, that's that's his fault. I mean, that that's that's his issues and that's his fault. Either you accept it and you take it and you go, okay, uh, man, I love you too, or, or don't pour your heart out to him. But when you're talking about Vince listening to other talent and siding with other talent in front of you, man, that's just the job. That's the job. You have to be mature enough to accept it, not take it personally, and move on with your business. Or if the heat's too hot, get out of the kitchen. That's just, I mean, that's just business. And that's the way that it is. And that's how Vince McMahon operates. So if that hurts your feelings or you're upset about it, maybe it's not for you. One of those examples that you're talking about where he just didn't get along with the talent is when he says Shawn Michaels came to visit and he got in Billy Gunn's head about changing some creative. So when Billy comes back to Russo and makes a comment about what the creative is and what changes he wants made, allegedly Russo tells him to go himself and road dog and Billy Gunn are furious about this, but eventually he goes back and tries to fix it by the end of the day. Is this pretty common for Russo where he would just be very abrasive and rub people the wrong way like that? Yeah, because that's the wrong way to handle that situation. Yeah. Talent's coming to you with, with, with a suggestion or another opinion. You listen to it and go, okay, and you either you can debate it, hit the pros and cons, or you go tell them to go themselves, and now that's going to piss them off and they're going to move in another different direction. Russo wrote in his book that one of the critical flaws of McMahon is that he would cave to the top stars, whether it was Hogan or it was Brett or it was Austin or it was Sean. And one of those moments was the WrestleMania 15 main event, which was supposed to be Austin rock and Foley. But he says that Shawn Michaels got in Austin's ear and Austin went to McMahon to get it changed. And he was the one who had to break the news to Foley that he was out of this WrestleMania main event. Is that a fair criticism of Vince that sometimes he would cave to the top stars? Vince, li Vince listens to everybody. Vince McMahon listens to everybody. And if he feels that somebody has a better idea, then he's going to go that way. No different than you know anything else in the business. Vince McMahon is going to make the final decision. And maybe because it was different than Vince Russo's decision, that he feels, oh, well, God, he didn't listen to me. He listened to somebody else. And so now Russo's upset about that. But that's all that is. And that happens to this day, every single day, that Vince McMahon may change his mind at the last minute based on whoever the hell he talked to last. So that's just called business and day-to-day -day life in the WWE. Russo says one of the things he hated about his job is that he had to travel with Vince McMahon a lot. And that meant you went everywhere Vince went, even if he went to get a haircut. You were with him almost 24-7, and all they ever talked about was the business. Never the families, never the children, just the business. And Russo even says right when he would fall asleep when they're traveling together, Vince would wake him up and want to talk about it more. And before they would part ways, McMahon would want assurance. Did I get it all? And Russo would say something like, every drop. He makes the analogy that, McMahon was almost a vampire after Russo's creativity and he needed everything he could get. Is that a fair assessment of McMahon and his relationship with the critical part of his inner circle? Yes, but that's what you sign up for. If, if you want to be a part, I love when people go, oh, you know, I want to be in the creative. Man, that's what you sign up for. I loved it when people would talk about how, oh, you guys travel in limousines and you got to a jet plane taking you and you're staying in these nice hotels. You get picked up in a limousine and you go to work in that car. You get out of the car, you get on the plane, you work the entire way to your destination. You get out at your destination and you work on that short ride from the plane to the arena. You work all day at the arena. You finish up in the arena. You get back in a limo to work, to 
talk about what you just did to get back to that plane to get on the plane and work to land in your next town get off that plane get in a limo work for your drive to the hotel at which point let's have a meeting and discuss some more about what the hell we're going to do tomorrow finish up three or four o'clock in the morning and end up with all right see you guys at eight o'clock to do some more work that's what you sign up for and if that's not for you don't sign up for it However, you know, that that was Vince McMahon. That is who he is. I can't tell you the number of haircuts that I went to. I can't tell you the number of Stephanie's basketball games that we would go to and we would bring our booking books into the gym and we would work while waiting for her game to start. Talk about the billionaire Ted skits because they start to air around that same time here in the first quarter of 96. Um how involved were you with those? Did was Vince there for the filming of it? Did he just review the tape? This feels like something that would have just tickled him. No, I wasn't there. Uh, I was only there for the, uh, billionaire Ted and Huckster match is the only one that I had to be involved in. And the rest of those were a product of Chris chambers and, uh, David Saadi that really masterminded those and came up with them and shot them from a guy that they had as a part at a party that did impersonations. And one of them was Ted Turner. So it was, uh, born out of that, out of, out of the guy that they had met and used for some different things and thought this guy does a pretty funny Ted Turner. Well, by God, billionaire Ted was born. It came out a few months ago. Um, I shouldn't say it came out. I was watching an old raw on the WWE network, which is now on Peacock. And I hear Bruce that you can sign up for just like $2 and 50 cents right now. Is that real? That is real. That's like the best value in the history of wrestling. I think $2. Yeah, pretty much, cents. man. I'd grab it. If I were you, yeah, check it out. By the way, it's on Peacock. So anyway, though, uh, there was something that ran at the end of a Monday night raw where Vince introduced an ad that he tried to run in the newspaper, uh, the wall street journal and the New York times, their financial section, and they both rejected it. So he was going to run a, a variation of that ad, but it was about, you know, attention shareholders. Uh, Ted Turner has lost like $30 million of your money. Where'd that money go? How aggressive was Vince in real life? not just on screen with the silly, funny, ha ha billionaire Ted, but how aggressive was Vince behind the scenes in real life about battling for his company, attacking this billionaire, Ted Turner. Well, I think that anytime that you challenge Vince and being the competitor that he is, and just the human being that he is, he's going to fight you. He's, he's going to do everything that he can do to survive. And this was an example of it. And you looked at the AOL Time Warner um, merger that they're working on. Yeah. And you look at TBS and you look at all this stuff and lo and behold, you couldn't find WCW in there. Right. You couldn't find all those losses. You couldn't find it. You couldn't even find where that number would have even been mysteriously written off. Right. You know what I mean? Where right. you, you knew what the number was and, and internally they sure as hell knew what that number was. So it was a, a, just a way to inform people and say, hey, you know, you, you're going to do this. You're trying, by the way, and you're trying to put me out of business. They stated that they wanted to put us out of business. Um, let's go. If you were going to armchair quarterback everything that was happening in this first quarter, do you think perhaps one of the reasons that the business was down a little bit and this WrestleMania was down a little bit is because Vince was so focused on what they were doing and he should have perhaps focused that energy on what he was doing. Hindsight being 2020, I wish that we had completely ignored them. Yep. Frankly, um, because we, and when we realized it is it's, we're doing everything that we found the territory guys did. We were, everybody was worried about what Vince was doing and trying to battle Vince instead of taking care of their own home. And I think that we became worried, not worried, but yeah, you, you, you start watching your competitor 
because the things that they were doing were making some noise. So if we had focused less on that and more on our own stuff and what I mean by less on that, ignore it, right. completely ignore it. Um, which has normally been the WWE way. Like you just right. Yeah. And I think that by doing it in a lot of ways, we gave them credibility and probably directed attention to them. And, and eventsism is never let them see you sell. And now for the first time ever, he's selling a little bit. Well, I, he's reacting for sure. Right. Yeah, definitely reacting. And I don't know that, you know, again, when you look back at it all these years later, but then we persevered and. Oh, it worked out. And, it worked and kept out. on. And, and again, when you look at the, the end story, it's. You get refocused, you take your resources and do everything that you can to take care of your business and stop worrying about their business. You will persevere in the end. As you were sort of giving your speech there about persevering, I remembered when we did live shows way back when, and we did one in Pittsburgh and we had Mr. Jerry McDivitt join us and he was doing a Q and a with the crowd, which in hindsight, can you believe we pulled that off? That's one of the craziest things we ever did. Uh, but one of the questions was about the whole Sean razor lawsuit, uh, not Sean and razor, but you know what I mean? That diesel razor lawsuit where the company was suing WCW for stealing their likeness. Well, eventually Turner settled and he disclosed at, the, at our little meet and greet thing. Yeah. We got $2 million out of that. And then uh, a few months later, we used that same money to buy their whole company. And is that not yeah. the <laughs> it's unbelievable? What do you think about it? Let's talk uh, about, uh, go ahead. No, it truly is. And, and it's, it's kind of like, um, Crockett buying the TBS time slot, you know, that, uh, Saturday, Saturday night time slot and buying that and then saying, okay, great. Hey, thank you very much. Cause we're going to use this to- <laughs> Fun WrestleMania. Yeah. In hindsight, I'm glad you brought that up because that is something I've thought about recently. You know, we just did that long form deep dive interview with Jim Crockett. uh, And of course, unfortunately we lost him earlier this year, but he, he, we talked about that extensively, but my follow up that he couldn't really answer anyway. So I didn't bother asking is, and maybe you've asked, do you think Vince could have actually pulled WrestleMania off without that cash infusion of that extra million bucks? I've always sort of gotten the impression he was borrowing from Peter to pay Paul to make that thing happen. And that extra million dollars couldn't have come at a better time. I think that it helped, but I, he definitely could have pulled WrestleMania off. Yes. That's WrestleMania right. was going to happen no matter what. Right. Uh, we also know that, uh, Phineas Godwin is going to debut, uh, who brought Dennis Knight in. Tell us how that came to be. Dennis was one of those guys, Tex Slazinger, um, that was always around and beloved by everyone. He had been in Florida and I think he worked uh, WCW as well for some some gigs and shit. But Tex was one of those guys that was always around and be loved by everyone. So whenever anything would come up, it would always be, hey, what about Tex? This was one of those as you're looking around going, hey, Tex is looking for a job. What about uh, using something here? And Phineas Godwin was born. Who can who comes up with P I G and H O G Phineas Godwin, and then Henry O Godwin. So they're P I G and H O G who silly shit is this? It's her names. Yeah. But that, is that a Vince McMahon thing? That nah, was probably a combination thing. <laughs> well, I'm glad that Russo stepped in because he says that before he started helping write TV, Uh, the last show before his involvement was a 1.9 rating. One of the lowest that raw had ever received. Um, he says, so I guess you could say there was nowhere to go, but up and up we went, you can read all you want about creative teams and booking committees. But during the time I was riding with Vince, those were fictitious teams. There was no team and there was no committee. It was Vince and I period to this day. McMahon might not even admit that for his own reasons. He wants you to think a group of writers gathered in a room every week to write TV. Well, maybe that's the case today, but back then it was just us. And the process worked like this. After we arrive home from raw, I would work on all 11 segments for the following week's show on my own. I would look at our roster of players and make sure that everyone was involved in a storyline or angle. This was quite important to the process because at the time, all Vince cared about was the top four guys and what they were doing. 
my philosophy was the top four guys weren't going to be around forever. So we need to start building for the future. And that's how it all began. Me, my brain and a computer. Once I had outline of the 11 segments, I would go to Vince's house the following day. Then I would pitch the entire show to Vince and we would add his ideas that usually consisted of a 10 hour day, just Vince and I sitting at his dining room table. I think this is where we complimented each other so well. I would just hit Vince with the big picture and he would fine tune it. Regardless of what has been said or what you may think, Vince hardly ever made drastic changes. He more or less went with what I had, adding his two cents to make it better. Remember, it's much easier to tweak a show than it is to sit down with a blank piece of paper and make something out of nothing. The next day, which was usually a Friday, I would format the show on my computer and that's what it came down to, me and a hard drive. Here's where I went over it with a fine tooth comb from who would enter the ring first to who would do the run in to who would go over to whose music needed to be cued after the match to the loser getting his revenge while the music was still playing. The final format involved everything pre tapes, live interviews, vignettes, commercial breaks, everything man. Writing that was so tedious, so demanding. It took me an average of eight to 10 hours to put the show on paper from there. I would distribute it to everyone in the television production department. Then, usually around 6 p.m. on Friday, I would go to Vince's office with the formatted show, and we would tweak some more. The tweaking would go on all weekend and continue up to and even during the day of the show. But in reality, when we arrived to the building to shoot raw, the show was 95% done. Vince and I used that system for the good part of two years, and I must say, it was magic. Uh, Bruce, is this the way you remember it going down? You weren't involved in any of this. Uh, neither was Cornette or anybody else. It was just Vince and Vince at his dining room table. For a long time. I mean, everybody that works in that creative process, that's, that's very similar to how it works. So, uh, that's the way that it did work for a long time. Uh, anything else you want to add to that? Or we're just going to sit here and well, stare no, at each other. No, I mean, it, it's, it's basically that that's fairly accurate what he laid out, but it's always going to be Vince McMahon. Who's going to have the final say on what goes and what doesn't go. And he, as he said, he's going to tweak it. Vince is going to tweak it and he's going to change it all the way up until it actually airs live on the show. But, um, for the long time, you know, and what Russo doesn't realize is that McMahon also, you know, still called Jr. still called me and whoever the hell else that he called for ideas that would contribute in that. We all had access to the, uh, but you just weren't at the dining room table. You're saying, so you're, no, we just weren't at the dining room table. No. Um, do you believe that maybe McMahon thought Russo works best when he feels like it's just them two and there's no other outside influences. That's fair to say. Yeah. Um, do you believe that this is what people mean when they say that McMahon was Russo's filter because he would, he would bring him the ideas and then Vince Russo prefers the term fine tune or throw his two cents in other people would say Vince was the filter. Isn't Vince that kind was, of, isn't man that, was a filter, but that's kind of the same thing. Is it not? Yes. You know, if, if the idea still comes through him and he tweaks it or fine tunes it or whatever word you want to put on it, he's filtering it in another word. Is that fair? Correct. Um, he says working that closely with Vince, you couldn't allow your feelings to get hurt. I mean, at the end of the day, it was his company. If he liked something, he liked it. If he didn't, he didn't. Luckily, nine times out of 10, he liked my stuff, which implies that he did at least filter one idea there in his own words. Very, very rarely did we go toe to toe. I can only remember one time where I got really hot and it was because he was caving into the talent and I knew it was wrong. It was the highway to hell SummerSlam 1998, the main event being a match between the undertaker and Steve Austin taker and Steve were hell bent on going into the match with a respect for each other rather than a hatred. The reason was obvious behind the scenes. These guys got along. But the truth was nobody cared if these guys went out drinking after a long day's rocking, they wanted to see them kill each other. Well, Vince caved and the match sucked. It was Madison square garden, a full house and nobody cared after the match, Austin and Taker were both disappointed and they couldn't understand the lack of crowd response. Hey, I could have told them and did. Do you remember this at SummerSlam 98 that these guys really wanted to approach the match a different way that ultimately left it flat? I don't know that it was left flat. I think that's a matter of opinion, but I do think that it is always going to be better when you have an audience and the audience has someone to root for and someone to cheer. I mean, to, to boo. Um, 
and these guys felt that they should go in as equals and they felt that they should go in, as he said, for, with a respect for one another. Um, I didn't think that the match was bad and I don't think that they shit all over it. I do know that, you know, I don't think Steven Taker thought it was their best effort, but that's just simply a matter of opinion. And that was something that the talent wanted to do. And Vince McMahon is always going to listen to the talent and will probably usually err on their side. Yeah, we'll talk about that uh, in a minute as well. Uh, Russo did say there's lots of misconceptions about working with Vince McMahon uh, that you wouldn't know unless you work closely with him. He says that Vince is not great at concepts, ideas, and big picture stuff. He's not this master everybody makes him out to be. But he believes that McMahon's forte and the thing that he would blow him away with constantly was that he could take things and make them a little bit better. Quote, he visualized things better than I ever could. It was a small tweak here and there that would turn a $50 million picture into a $100 million blockbuster. And that was Vince McMahon's genius, seeing things that nobody else could. Do you think that's a fair assessment that maybe it's not always the big picture that's where Vince is best, but his short game is unbeatable? You mean kind of like a filter? Bingo. He also well, no, and, and, but I do disagree also on the big picture thing because uh, I've always found, and again, it it comes from 22 years versus two years that his big mm-hmm. picture is unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. I mean, yeah, he told us like back in the, what'd you say? The, the mid eighties or late eighties, early nineties, he's talking about a network way, right. way, way before that was a real thing. Yeah. And I'm thinking it's a cable network or sure. you know, <laughs> a well, regular he, television station. Well, he probably was too. It's not like he's like, it'll be by Netflix, pal. In yeah. <laughs> no, I know. You know what I mean? But no, he always did have those grandiose visions. Always has all and probably still does today. Uh, he also says one of Vince McMahon's best attributes. And this surprised me was his patience because I've never really considered McMahon to be a patient person, but Russo says when the ratings would come in every week, they'd all be sitting at his house, but Vince never had a strong reaction one way or another. Even when they were losing the nitro, uh, he says that Vince would often joke. We worked hard. We worked damn hard for these threes. And this is a side of Vince McMahon. We don't get to hear about very often. Does this version of him really exist? This patient stay the course. It'll be okay. In the end, there's no knee jerk reaction. I think we, as fans, kind of armchair quarterback the booking and see when they hot shot something. And we assume, oh man, they're doing this already. They could have dragged this out a little more. This is over too soon. Uh, I wish there was more patience, but here Russo saying, no, he could be very patient. What say you he Bruce? Could, he definitely could be. He could also be that knee jerk son of a bitch too. And there were times it's funny. And I guess in competition, when, when you're moving upward and you're happy with that. There's time to be patient. I think nowadays when he looks at the ratings and they go down, there may be more of a knee jerk reaction to God damn it. We got to fix this. So you get a little bit of both. I think it depends on his surroundings at the time. Russo described the booking philosophy that he worked out with McMahon like this. We wrote every show to be better than the last and every show as if it were our last, you see, there was a formula. Along with patience, Vince and I took every traditional wrestling outcome or finish and went the other way. Whatever the audience was expecting, give them the unexpected. Immediately, this brought unpredictability to the product, something it had been lacking for years. Baby faces would do heel things, and sometimes heels would even do baby face things. This was unheard of. It had been written in stone. A heel had to act one way while a baby face acted another. Well, guess what? We dropped no through that stone off the Brooklyn bridge. There were no more rules and regulations in your opinion, Bruce, how critical was this tweener style booking to the success of the attitude era? And does Russo deserve the bulk of the credit for it? I think Russo deserves some credit for bringing it up and, and being able to sell that idea at events and to sell him to actually try it on and do it. It's nothing new, and it's nothing that hadn't been sold to him before. Um, it was a new voice. It was a new sales pitch. It was a shiny, uh, some people used to say, it was the shiny new car. So he was listening to it more, and thank God he did because it did help the business. And I do credit Russo for a lot of that. But it was 
is Vince McMahon used to try to explain to everybody, we don't have black and white anymore, it's shades of gray. So the idea was that, you know, that baby face could have more heel tendencies and, and vice versa. But the idea was to be unpredictable and to have must-see television. The I think that eventually, which I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, it, it got to be the point of everything being a swerve, which after a while, your unpredictability is predictable. Predictable, yeah. Um, Russo says McMahon always positioned himself to be Mr. Invisible as far as you know any sort of outside of wrestling folks knowing what he did. Uh, he specifically says that Kevin Dunn once invited him to meet with a bunch of TV executives and Russo thought he wowed him. Uh, so when Russo followed up with Kevin Dunn about the next meeting, Dunn said he would no longer be needed in any of those meetings. Is this just Russo paranoia or did man kind of like to he- keep his secret sauce secret? It's probably Russo, uh, Russo paranoia. Um, he also wrote that when the company was about to go public, that the PR company had, uh, sent out a prospectus printing up, you know, all the, the featured people, the key people in the organization who made it tick. Uh, and there he was in all his glory, Jim Ross. I even think he had his cowboy hat on. If Jim Ross was more valuable to Titan sports than I was, then Michael Jordan was more valuable to the white Sox than he was the bulls. Ross and I weren't even on the same playing field. He played the role of yes, man, I made a difference. Do you remember this prospectus and any sort of fallout from the staff beyond Russo here? I don't remember any fallout beyond Russo. I do remember Russo's fallout on it. He felt that he had been slighted, but the prospectus was one of vice presidents and uh, key people uh, that had a, that were an officer in the company. Russo was not an officer. He wrote, man, every magazine with a picture of Vince made me want to vomit. The guy was taking credit for everything, and I was nowhere to be found, not even a footnote. At first, it wasn't a big deal as long as Vince paid me. But the better we did and the more Vince talked about himself, the more despondent I became. Vince the genius, yeah, right. This was the guy that gave the go-ahead for whose tag team partner what. Uh, Bruce, in your opinion, is being paid enough? Uh, or do you need to get some sort of constant credit for everything you were ever associated with? I don't know. He was just a writer, right? So how much credit did he really need? He, a minute ago, he said that he didn't take credit. Then he says he doesn't get enough credit. I, I'm totally confused on this. Wrote that he uh, was in a spot where he had to travel with Vince a lot. Quote, that was brutal. When we were on the road, I was attached to Vince's hip 24-7. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to paint a negative picture of the boss here, but it was taxing. You'd be working every passing minute the moment you got in the car. Whether it was a 30-minute drive or a four-hour road trip, you were talking wrestling. Not the wife, not the kids. They didn't matter. All that mattered was the show. And the minute you fell asleep, the very second, he would take great joy in waking you up. At the very end of every trip, Vince would turn to me and ask, did I get it all? Referring to my energy, creativity, my entire life force. And I used to answer every drop. In essence, Vince was the vampire, and I was the poor, pale victim laying on the floor with the blood sucked out of his neck. The humor, <laughs> the humor of it is that people actually used to envy me because I rode with Vince. Envy me, you can have him. Uh, you had the pleasure of traveling with Vince McMahon, Bruce. Is this fairly accurate? That's a very good depiction, and though there were those of us that were extremely ecstatic when we didn't have to travel with Vince anymore. So yeah, that's very accurate. Okay. 1997, not only historic for what's happening on camera, but a pretty big thing going down behind the scenes as well. Before Raw would go on the air, Vince would have a private meeting with Bret Hart about the 20 year contract that they signed at Bret's house on October 9th, 1996. Bret is called into Vince's office and Vince tells him he's going to have to breach Bret's contract. He says that he can't pay him his full salary because of the problems he's had trying to compete with Ted Turner and he wants to honor his contract, but Ted has made that impossible. And Vince calls Brett, the Cal Ripken of the WWF and says that he fully intends to pay him what he's owed on the back end of his 20 year contract. And Brett wrote of this meeting with Vince. He said, Vince said something like, I have no problem. If you want to see if WCW will make you the same deal as before. I hear that Hogan is finishing up there soon. 
and your timing couldn't be more perfect. And Vince then told Brett, if he left, he'd actually be doing Vince a favor because he was about to downsize to a Northeastern United States promotion. And allegedly he tells Brett that because of his 14 years of loyal service, he wanted to give Brett the opportunity to approach WCW before everyone else did since he'd be letting a lot of wrestlers go. And Vince then told him, quote, you don't even have to drop the belt. If you don't want to, you hold all the cards. And Vince even said he would secretly help Brett negotiate the deal with WCW if Brett wanted him to. And Vince said he'd see if he could find a way to pay Brett, but ask Brett for now to keep this to himself. And Vince says, if word gets out that he's in trouble, it would actually hurt Brett's chances of negotiating that deal with Bischoff. And Brett said he was so stunned by how many promises that Vince had broken in one conversation that he didn't even know how to reply. So there's a lot to unpack in this conversation, and I want us to take several minutes to do so. But first of all, going into this meeting, since you've now been ostracized from the power circle because you're, um, not a good person or good at your job. I'm horrible. Or, or, exactly. I'm glad we agree. Yeah. My uh, father 22 <laughs> years. Yeah. I was just absolutely the shit. The shits. Yeah. Um, they'd never hire me back ever. Did you, did you know this meeting was going to happen ahead of time? Did I guess what I'm trying to get into is sort of like when Vince has to, I, I don't think this has ever happened before where Vince had to go to a guy and sort of bend his knee and say, Hey man, I'm in a fucking bad spot and I can't honor my word here. So I want to do right by you. Let's figure something out. Vince has always been in the power position. So for him to sort of open himself up and be vulnerable and then admit, fuck man, I'm taking an L on this and I got to try to fix this with you. What can we do? It feels like that's so out of his comfort zone that he might've talked about it with his inner circle, maybe even practiced the speech. How can, and then brainstormed, how do we present it? What options are there? What can we offer him? How do we, how do we get out of this jam that we're in? Did any of that happen? We knew that he was going to approach Brett. We knew what his options were. And you have to understand, you know, there's two sides to every story. So as you, you listen to even the things that, that Brett says, it's some of it's accurate. I, I don't think that, uh, in that conversation that Vince would have said, you don't need to drop the, be the belt. If you, if you go to our competitor, I, I don't think that that was said, but I wasn't there. So I, I, I don't know. And I can't tell you that yes or no, that any of that was said. However, I do know the uh, the gist of the conversation from from our side and from the business side of things. And looking at it, you know, if Vince could have honored that deal and if Vince could have had Brett never go to WCW, I think he would have. And he did mean it when I can take care of you on the other side. However, right now, was in a jam and needed some help, needed some relief. At the same time, you had Brett, who, whenever he had the chance, would let people know that he had turned down $3 million at WCW and that um, what a lucrative deal that he turned down to be here and, and I could go over there anytime I wanted to. So hearing that, after a while, I think Vince felt, well, maybe he would be happier over there. And if, if he can't do this, then perhaps making the money will make him happier. So he wanted to give him that opportunity and, and say, look, if that's what you want to do, um, I do need some relief. If you're not cool with that, you want to go see what's on the other side, go see what's on the other side and I'll work with you to make that happen if that's what you want to do. So, um, it was a, it was a tough time. I think that was a difficult conversation for Vince. It was made even more difficult for Vince because Vince had been there. We'd been in the garden all day, obviously, in, in production. And Brett didn't get there till later, much later in the day, while Vince was getting made up to go out and do commentary. So. Uh, not having that time to sit down with Brett and, and be able to 
possibly go back and forth. It was a a quick meeting prior to going on the air live where Vince had to get everything out. And I'm sure that it came across like a very one-sided conversation. Brett, this is where I'm at. So we need to do, here's what I'm willing to do. And if I can help you in the other way and you can go there, I'll do that. Um, right now I got to go out and do raw. So there, you know, it, it's, it's great to, to publish a book and, and put your side of the story. And that's what books are for, man. To, to get your story out there, but it doesn't it neglects the other side. And there, there's a whole nother, whole nother part to that story. What does it say about the way the WWE was working at the time to call them on a Thursday for a Monday show for a really big angle like this? Shit. We used to make calls on Saturday and Sunday for a Monday show and say, what are you doing tomorrow? Can you can you be in in Detroit on Monday? Isn't that amazing? Just the way the business is. Sometimes he'll be sitting there at dinner on a Saturday night. I gotta have Bischoff. Get me Bischoff. God damn it, where's Jr. Jr. I've had shit three o'clock in the morning. Huh? Hey pal, what are you doing? I like titties and I like chocolate. Oh my god. Bye. <laughs> what, are what? You, what are you doing? I'm just saying that, that weird things come at weird hours. The boogeyman. Then there's a lot of last minute shit. <laughs> Oh, gosh. In early 2002, we would see the NWO and the WWE. Only the two could come together. Also available in our archives. Did anyone pitch uh, Eric? Chocolate titties. Oh, gosh. Uh, there's My new favorite saying. I'm just going to say that from now on. Please don't. Uh, we need a t-shirt for that. But I don't want anybody to buy that, actually. Up next, Vince McMahon versus no one. Because after Vince purchased WCW, all he had left was a football league, a private jet, and zero competition. Uh, Vince does an interview with uh, the Atlanta newspaper, and he talks about the state of the industry. And he says, professional wrestling isn't flying high through pop culture as it was during the late 90s. We're certainly not at our peak at the moment. Our business has always been one of ebb and flow, but not unlike any other entertainment business. When you look at the movie business, sometimes the studio have really good product and sometimes they don't. The same could be said for the arena business. It's been down across the board from concerts to family entertainment. So it becomes more competitive and we're in competition with ourselves, whether it's other pay-per-view offerings or video games or things of that nature. We're in all of those platforms. And when you ask someone to bring their family, pay for parking, a hot dog or a t-shirt, you're really talking about a lot of money. And we have to make certain that if someone goes that far and commits to the product, that they get their money's worth and then some, and it's not an all, it's not always an easy thing to do. I've always been fascinated when Vince talks about business when it's down, because we, we, we're all very familiar with the Mr. McMahon character and the bravado of, you know, I held the fate of that company in my hands. And so sort of the Mr. McMahon, the conqueror persona juxtaposed to, well, business isn't as great as it once was the businessman. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you think his finger on the pulse of the future of WWE was in early Oh five here. Well, I, look, he's always got his finger on the pulse and he's always looking several years down the road. So to be able to look and say, okay, here's where we are, and this is this is the ride. Um, here's the ride we're going to take, and look to the future. They're asking him to speak on today, and he's speaking on today and speaking on the past. But in Vince's head, he's always so far beyond it that when you know little things come up, like a dip in business that sidetracks him that gets to be very frustrating because you, you can't look at what are we going to do in 2010 here at this point. And that's where his head was. You know, one of the things that has often been discussed is, Oh, it's because, you know, WWE doesn't have competition. They were at their best when they had competition. And in the same interview with the Atlanta newspaper, he would write in some ways, I miss our great rivalry. 
We were both burning the candle at both ends. And it was a question of whose candle was going to burn out first because it was such an intense rivalry. Both sets of talent were overexposed and overworked at that pace. Of course, someone's going to burn out. We couldn't really have a meeting of the minds. I couldn't have just called Ted and said, Hey, let's slow down and both live for a while. That's antitrust. And you can't do that. Our country isn't based on that. It's based on competition. And there certainly was no goal by our company to be the sole survivor at this level of the business today. It just happened that way as such, by being the only game in town, so to speak, it creates an awesome responsibility for us now. And he's saying all of this while, you know, TNA is, is landing a deal with, uh, Fox sports net and is hopeful on landing a national television show. We know that's going to happen. That's definitely coming. Do you think Vince was, was not as did Vince lose a step creatively? Was he less motivated without competition? It does feel like Vince is, you know, if you guys were both gonna not necessarily carpool somewhere, you're going to caravan somewhere you're in your car and he's in his car. He's going to fucking get wherever y'all are going first, right? Absolutely. He's just competitive by nature. And so I wonder, you know, does, does that sort of, when that goes dormant, does that part of his competitive nature and the creative juices that maybe come through that just go away? No, uh, he finds ways to compete with himself and he finds ways to just look at what they've accomplished and go, okay, we need to beat that. So no, he'll, he'll always find ways to, maybe it's not Ted Turner. Maybe now it's paramount or universal and I've got to beat them. And he's always going to have some, he's always going to have a goal and he's always going to have something to overcome no matter what it is or to invent and take to the next level. Maybe just who he is. Uh, it was in the book, the long bomb, and it was reported that Vince tried to buy the Minnesota Vikings and then he tried to buy the Washington Redskins. Do you remember there ever being a conversation? Because at some point Vince, Vince had a real hard on for this. And he starts to inquire about buying a team The the CFL tries to sell him a team. He wants to buy the whole fucking league. They say no. So then he starts the XFL, but somewhere in there, there's at least preliminary conversations about Vince buying the Vikings, which I find fascinating and the Washington Redskins. There was interest there. Yeah. Whenever a team would, would start to send feelers out, they would, you know, they have that rich guy feeler system that they send out feelers to rich people that, that own rich guy stuff, rich guy stuff. Well, you know, you know, you probably get a lot of that. And, uh, there, no. there was some interest. There was some, some talk back and forth and stuff. Rich guy stuff in Huntsville, Alabama. It's like investing in a barbecue restaurant. It's not buying the Washington Redskins. It's a different level kind, sir. Well, you know, uh, uh-huh. so let's kind of talk about how this harebrained idea comes about. Uh, you, you saw in the documentary, the in, that NBC is losing the NFL. They've made a business decision that for the ask that the NFL has, they're going to lose money if they proceed. So they just bow out. So they need content and they love professional football because of what the NFL has brought them, but they're trying to run a business and keep it in the black. And the 2000 Olympics from Sydney, Australia do them no favors because there's a 15 hour time difference. So it has the lowest rating since 1968. They lose a ton of money. And they offer to do make good ads. And they, on top of all that, they lose the NFL. So NBC is getting hammered. You've got big shows like um, Survivor trying to compete with a flagship show, Friends, and they're going head to head with NBC. So they're looking for stuff. And Dick, who is, as you saw in the show, one of the founders of Saturday Night Live, and the guy who worked with Vince to put together Saturday night's main event hears that Vince is doing press conferences about the XFL. Now, before we talk about whose idea that first was, they didn't talk about it too much here, but the original plan was for it to be on UPN, which was the home of SmackDown at the time. Is that the way you remember it? Yeah, it was, it was originally 
we kind of felt that we didn't have a deal, but there were initial talks with UPN and uh, Spike TV. It's all owned by Viacom and CBS. And there was a thirst at the time. There's a lot now, but this is when it was really becoming super hot for reality television. And it was probably first, one of the really first popular shows was on MTV. It was uh, Real World, road, road Rules, shit like that. But now it's on mainstream. And so Survivor is smashing and other shows like that are doing big numbers. So Vince has an idea to make professional football more of a reality show and so much of that worked but some of it didn't work and that's what we'll get into one of the misconceptions though bruce that i don't think a lot of people really knew is that the xfl is not like an abbreviation it's not the extreme football league they never said that it was just xfl the extra fun league how fucking dumb is that i mean do you do you feel dumber when you say it because you have a huge shit in grin when you say that <laughs> no, it was just, you know, they it had absolutely zero meaning. It was just the XFL. Is it I like love it. Now, let me ask you this. Extra we, fucked up league. <laughs> Extra fornicating league. We uh extreme fornicating lady. <laughs> mm -mm. God damn pal. We talked about the X title on the TNA show and you got half hot about it because you said, what does it mean? Nobody can tell me what it means. It doesn't fucking mean anything. And now here you're fine with the it. Being vision. Yeah. That, that's fucking ridiculous. Silliest goddamn thing I ever heard in my life. The X division. Yeah. Silliest goddamn thing I've ever heard in my life. Sillier than the XFL. Oh God. Yes. This is amazing. <laughs> At least the XFL had a black and red football. <laughs> this logic. This logic. Oh, my gosh. Um, so how does this originally, you know, we've heard the whole Carl, Carl DeMarco story, and, and I want you to kind of set the record straight. How involved was Carl DeMarco in the creation of the XFL? Carl DeMarco, Carl DeMarco, for those of you who don't know, uh, was the president of WWF Canada. Do I have that title right? <laughs> yeah, Carl was the president of Canada. I said WWF Bison, Canada. Bison Head. Yeah, Bison Head. Why do you call him Bison Head? Uh, actually, Jim Cornette nicknamed him Bison Head. Goddamn fucking Bison Head, motherfucker. <laughs> What is about? Like, I'm never coming to your goddamn country again anyway. Fuck you. Put horns on that son of a bitch. Put him in Idaho. They'll kill him. <laughs> Make beef jerky out of that fucking motherfucker. Gigantor head. What was Carl DeMarco's involvement in the XFL? Nothing. I think Carl simply brought the CFL opportunity uh, to Vince. And when that didn't work out, Vince had a bug then that he wanted yeah. to do football. God damn it, I'll own my own league. And so he holds a press conference, and he has, I mean, you guys did a great job designing the logo. I assume that was a WWE person who made the logo? I guess, man. Uh, here, Here's the thing. When, when Vince started talking football and started talking about all this shit, I ran. I, I tried to get as far away from those meetings as I could get. Because, man, I lived through the WBF. I lived through ICA Pro and, <laughs> and some of that uh, shit. I'm, I'm hearing about goddamn football and XFL and offseason and, 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 and trying to do this during WrestleMania season. And I ran. I, I, you know, I play football in high school. I watch it occasionally on TV. I didn't ask, where the hell's my football <laughs> at the end of the Super Bowl? I watched the Super Bowl for the commercials and went, hey, that was a cool Dorito commercial. So I, I didn't have that same passion. I didn't care. Well, because you don't like football. I like football. I just, I, I don't live and die by football. I took you to an Alabama game and you celebrated and yelled home run when they scored a touchdown. And I did that that rolling rolling thunder thing, roll tides, 
when remember I had the pom pom and I did it when they when they scored the uh, the touchdown or the 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 base hit thing. Remember that guy? Remember that guy hit the home run or caught the home run or whatever he did? Well, you know, you know. Uh, Meltzer said through that field goal. You mentioned you just rattled off WBF and blah blah blah. Uh, Meltzer had a quote this last week that I really enjoyed, and I want to get your take on it. Quote: Vince is the best wrestling promoter there's ever been. But Vince's track record outside of wrestling is actually the shits. Okay. Agree? Disagree? I think that Vince does a lot better in the wrestling world than that bubble. Yeah. So Vince a- does great in, in the entertainment world. I, I, I will say that. I'm not just going to put him to wrestling because he does do well in entertainment and has broadened the scope of wrestling. So. When so, he when he when he deviates from the was the sports du- sports wrestling entertainment yeah okay was the WBF entertainment to him it was is the movie studio entertainment yeah but that's doing well now uh, how, is the restaurant entertainment yeah because do 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 what we do over here we make money do 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 I don't know what the fuck you do that was Michael Hayes to the uh, president of the. Uh, WWF Studios one time in a meeting. What? <laughs> we're we're in a meeting in the conference room, and we're and Vince has the creative people. I think it was like me, Michael, Brian Gewertz, and and the head of WWF uh, movies. And Michael just is so frustrated that we're sitting there having to come up with ideas for movies and shit. And says, "Well, hey, I tell you, they were going around asking, and he asked somebody what they did. He goes, hey, I'll tell you what I do. I make money for this company. What the fuck do you do? <laughs> <laughs> doop, doop, doop. And I just, I mean. Was Vince in the meeting when he screams that? Dude, yeah. Vince was in the meeting. Linda was in the meeting. And Vince popped huge. It was it was priceless because he was right. Michael's sitting there, and we're frustrated because we're because we've got we still have to go produce Do real life the shit, shit that go, the real life shit that's making the money for the company, and we're sitting in there trying to help this son of a bitch do his job out in Hollywood, and yeah, it was hilarious. I don't know what the fuck you do. I make money for this company. They, they, they. So Vince goes to UPN. Vince goes to UPN and says, "I want to start a football league." And they support him. I'd say we're in. They did, yeah. How does he pitch it? Are you involved or privy to that meeting at all? No, no, man. I, I like I said, I ran from all that shit. I'm hearing, I'm hearing the the rumblings that everybody else is hearing. I, I'm hearing the stuff in the hallways. Okay, I am not. I, I get the meetings every once in a while. I get updates from Vince here and there, but I'm not in those. All right, here's what we're going to do. We've got this TV deal here. We've got the – nope, not there. And the word in the office is, is you know, we're going to have our own uh, football division. Nobody in wrestling. We're going to have a completely separate office staff, completely separate everything, a uh, football division under the WWF umbrella. And I couldn't get far enough away from it. I would I would hear it and go okay hey yeah that's cool Basil Devito would walk into my office and and show me the football and and tell me a story about something that happened with the XFL and hey this is really cool we're gonna do that and go hey that's cool man I'll I'll watch one on TV there by God when did you get sucked in about five days before the very first game <laughs> the okay. the the Thursday or Friday before the a week before the first game, I, I was told that uh, it's all, all all hands on deck, pal. But it wasn't all hands on deck. And that was what was bullshit. It was it was me. And, <laughs> it was me and Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler. What the fuck? Yeah, and and Michael Hayes and Brian Gewertz. And I'm sitting there thinking, why in the fuck? Do we? If it's all hands on deck, bring everybody. Make everybody come be miserable with us. Why do? We, is it only me that has to be miserable? So let's talk about um, 
these press conferences. Did you see any of these initial press conferences when Vince is promising that what happened to my football it needs to be more violent, no pansy shit, it's the no fun league? Did you see any of that rehearsed, practiced, or are you just watching it on ESPN like everybody else? I'm just sitting there watching it after the fact. It's important to mention here that by 99, WCW is in full-on self-destruction mode, and the WWF's on fire. The average age for the WWE at the time was 23 years old, and 40% of the audience is under the age 17. So the WWF is dominating the coveted advertiser demo of 18 to 34, which, by the way, so does this podcast. Thanks for everyone listening. Uh, they're beating the NFL on Monday night in certain demos, including this male 18 to 34. So that's a big deal when you can beat Monday night football for males, 18, 34. And Vince starts to develop a bit of a reputation as having the Midas touch when it comes to this demographic. And this is also a time where the networks are scrambling a little bit because baseball's business is way down. Ratings are terrible. Ticket sales are terrible. There was a little bit of a shot in the arm, pardon the pun, for Sosa and McGuire in 98. Uh, but wrestling is super hot. And Vince is credited with that because he has the, quote, secret for the young viewers. And this whole Canadian Football League thing gets scrapped. So a year out... He announces the XFL, and the basic idea is, well, if we just get a percentage of their audience, we'll be fine. And, of course, um, that actually happened a year later. But it's not, if you believe the movie, it's not until after the press conference is done that NBC jumps in. Do you remember thinking when NBC got involved and it wasn't UPN, oh, shit, this is real. Well, UPN was still involved. UPN yeah. and Spike were all still involved. At Spike at the time is TNN, but still, same company, and, and, and they're going to carry kind of the B games, but NBC takes it to another level from UPN. Well, NBC became 50% partners right. with us and, and picking up 50% of the costs, and they were a partner in this deal. So it was it was much more so than just a broadcast partner in a, in a broadcast deal. It was they were partners in the league. They were part owners of the league. And there's a lot of confidence in this because of the reputation that NBC has. Um, who in the company, is there a wrestling person who would have had a heavy influence as far as helping with coaches or personnel or st like football operations at all? Or did Vince no. outsource all of that to NBC? How, how does that come about as far as you remember? No, Vince went out and hired somebody, uh, somebody that had worked for the NFL. I couldn't tell you their name and my life depended on it. See, and but Vince, that, that's part of the documentary that frustrates me is they don't ask that. Like, who the fuck is picking football players? That's because they're not Conrad Thompson. Well, roll title okay. now. Okay, they don't do the kind of research that you do that has made something to wrestle with the number one podcast in the world today well that's a shoot especially Just in the saying. wrestling category more than two million downloads in the last 30 days um not a lot of people abroad are probably familiar with upn can you kind of rank them as a network amongst the major networks at the time well let's see you got one two three, cbs four, is five, number six. one uh nbc is number two abc is number three fox is number four cw it's five. Yeah. Um, there's that uh, local affiliate uh, PBS station in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, that's probably about <laughs> number six. And then there's UPN. There you go. What does UPN stand for? The United uh, United. I don't remember what the hell. Uh, United Paramount Network, something like that. It was United something network. Nobody fucking think. remembers. Here's one from, uh, Bobby blue. What a great question. This is now that all the billionaires are going to space is Mr. McMahon going to become a space club billionaire. 
Yeah, we're going, uh, I think, in February. We're. <laughs> <laughs> to the moon, Alice. I love that you're going to be in, in space booking fucking TV. Well, yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to say. We've got to write TV. We've got to do creatives. So. God damn, pal. They don't have cable up here. We've got to get down. Ah, shit. Wi-Fi sucks in here. I thought the peacock knock would, uh, the peacock app would work better up here. We're in fucking space. Doesn't it all come from a satellite? Jesus. Right there. I can see the damn thing. <laughs> anybody, anybody got the password? <laughs> Here, Bruce, uh, log me in, Mal. Yeah. Uh, so great, dude. Christopher Wheeler wants to know what was Vince's reaction when Bischoff challenged him to a fight at Slamboree 98. <laughs> if you know him, give him a call. We'll just go fight in a garage somewhere. If he really wants to fight, I'll fight him. Goddamn. But he wasn't going like, to give them a boost. No, of course not. Yeah, I was like, hey, we'll go to a parking lot. We'll go to a garage somewhere. She, she and I walk in. Whoever walks out, walks out. You know, I know that uh, a lot of times people say, oh, it's not personal. It's just business. And other people say, oh, there's nothing more personal than business. Do you think Vince took all the Bischoff stuff personally? Or did he realize, ah, this is just fucking promotion. Nobody cares. Yeah, it's both, man. It really and truly is. I don't think he took the fight personally at all. Yeah. I think he kind of, you know, laughed that off, but it was like, a, you know, Vince would like to fight. Okay. You want to go fight? Let's go fight. Uh, Paul wants to know uh, when you would go out to dinner with, uh, Vince or maybe go to a bar with Vince and someone recognized him and asked for a photo or autograph, would he oblige or what did that look like? Yeah, he'd oblige. I mean, Vince always been nice to people when they come up and ask him for stuff. And, you know, unless, you know, you're busy or you're running and trying to catch a flight or you, you want to get out of Dodge and you're going somewhere. I think that Vince has always taken time to stop and sign autographs and say hello to people. A couple other news and notes before we get to, uh, the pay-per-view itself. Uh, one of which really stuck out to me. Uh, this is from Wade Keller. Vince McMahon, the U Vince McMahon's usage of a private jet was scrutinized in the wall street journal article last week. Quote, there's the tiny world wrestling entertainment, which last year started allowing its CEO, Vince McMahon to take personal trips on its $20 million company jet for his quote unquote, personal safety. Uh, he would say in McMahon's defense of having the plane in general, he does hold booking meetings between raw and SmackDown and others within his inner circle and is doing such on commercial flights. That would be very difficult. His time giving his tight schedule on consecutive days, holding TV and pay-per-view events is extremely valuable. So avoiding the time standing in line at airports seems reasonable. That doesn't excuse it for personal reasons at the expense of stockholders though, which is basically the gist of the article quote. These people most able to afford it themselves. So why are the stockholders subsidizing their leisure time? And the article notes that many other companies larger than WWE do not allow its CEO, the use of the company plane for private trips. Most company CEOs are also not known as publicly as McMahon. So quote unquote security may be a defensible issue. It is the same reason used by other CEOs, but none of those are nearly as well known publicly as Vince. What do you make of this? I don't know. This sort of jumped out to me. Like who cares? I mean, what's well, the, but it's also someone making, uh, something out of absolutely nothing. And well, that's my point. What like, Vince used the jet for was to go to work. Right. And that was, that's the gist of this, I guess is as hardcore wrestling fans listening to this, who amongst us has heard about Vince's famous vacations. Crickets. That shit doesn't yeah. happen. The motherfucker wakes up, goes to work, and then takes a 12 minute vampire nap and he's back to work again. Like, there's no chance that this guy is going to fucking Turks and Caicos every weekend. I know that because I'm trying to chase your ass down to record a podcast and you're, you're not suntan, my friend. No, I am not. And it's, yeah, that to me, that is one of the most ludicrous things. Because again, from the standpoint of Vince doesn't take vacations and he's taking the jet to work. Right. 
and he fills the jet up with people. Guess what you get to do on the plane? Work. Work. Oh, and you get picked up in limousines. Guess what you do in the limousine ride from the plane to the building? Work. There you go. So it's uh, I can I can guarantee you if you were to poll the people that are on the plane who would rather be on a commercial airline and be getting themselves to and from TV and hotels and what have you that they would probably prefer to be on a commercial flight where they could kind of get away from everything for a minute. But uh, the corporate jet was and still is used to work, to maximize your time. And frankly, you know, don't talk about what's going on in my life and everything today, but I will say this, that the reason I moved to Connecticut was to be able to utilize that perk so that I could see my family. <laughs> hey, let's mention that because when, back before you'd made the move and you were in Houston, just run down what your weekly schedule was like. So our listeners will maybe have a little more appreciation for how difficult it was for you and I to find time to record. Well, I would, on a normal week, I would leave on a, um, uh, on a Monday and return on a Wednesday. And then you would go right into meetings that would last till three or four o'clock in the morning on Wednesday and Thursday. Then you would go, uh, actually Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, hang on now. You said I would leave. What you mean is you would leave your house. I'd leave my house at say 12 o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday to fly into the town on Sunday night. I would do TV on Monday and Tuesday. And then on Wednesday I would fly back home. And as soon as you're back home, you're hitting the ground running and you're in constant meetings. And then from there you meet all the way. And that includes Saturday. I got out of Sunday meetings most of the time because I was traveling. I'm talking about the times where, cause there was a stint there for a couple of months where you wouldn't fly home on Wednesday. You would fly to Connecticut oh, yeah. and stay in the hotel and still go to the office on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, fly home on Saturday, spend time with the family, repack, record with me. And then on Sunday at noon, you're back out again. So you had Saturday afternoon and evening and Sunday morning at home. And then the rest of the time living out of a hotel and connect. So when you were like, Hey, I think I'm going to move to Connecticut. I'm like, well, fucking a yeah. Because now the difference is when you guys have to go to TV, you hop on the jet with Vince and you're home and sleep in your own bed every night. Yes. Now, of course the, get, the down, you know, but you know why? Because you have a 1 a.m. meeting at the office. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we, we go from, uh, yeah, we go from a meeting on Thursday night and and go home and writer's assistants put everything together so that we have it on the plane to go over on Friday. Yes. I'm, I'm there and back, but the lure for me is I get to sleep in my own bed and wave wave at your wife in the morning. yeah. Yeah. But at least I get to see them now. Well, my favorite thing that's happened recently with you and I, is I sent you like a picture of a cocktail, at like 1130 at night. And then you sent back a selfie and you were still at the office. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And you're like, I'm waiting on my nine o'clock meeting to start. It's 1130 my time, which is 1230 your time. And you're like, I'm waiting on my nine o'clock to start. So your nine o'clock is going to start at 1 AM. And, uh, if you're lucky, if <laughs> And then when you, when the meeting adjourns at 5 a.m., everybody, well, you are expected to be back in the office at 8 a.m. So run home, get a little cat nap, see you in a couple hours. This ding, is, ding, ding. This is where we are. The wrestling business. Be careful what you ask for. Yeah. And then I'll send you, I have a window. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I've got an hour and a half here. Now that's Here's my window. Yeah. We started recording this show this morning at 6 a.m. So. That's where our window is, but damn it. We're doing our best for you. Sorry about missing in your house last week, but this is where we are. And and by the way, 
things have not exactly gotten easier in a pandemic where a lot of folks can't come into the office, but God damn it. Now you live in Stanford. You're right there. So yeah, there you go. Well, not only that. And, and again, it's for all the right reasons. You know, there's no one in the office. However, uh, my team comes in and my team is, is a small team, but it, it's, we socially distance, we do all the right things and it's, gets me out of the house. Now I want out of the house, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the best was different. So that's why I laugh when someone talks about, Oh, Vince is doing something for his personal motherfucker. Where? I wish he would do more <laughs> personal <laughs> shit. <laughs> I could take a break. Yeah. I mean, he deserves it. Uh, so that's laughable to think that Vince is going on these Bahama vacations, taking a corporate jet somewhere. That's it's you ask anyone that, that knows back in 2005 was Vince just taking off and going on vacation or going on personal trips is ludicrous. Yeah. And to bring that up, and then when they find out how stupid that those people must feel, they, they must feel like dirt sheet writers every fucking week when they realize the stupid things that they write and say and that come out of their mouth. Um, <laughs> you know I had to get something in here. Uh, yeah, that's just ludicrous. Do you remember? Ludicrous! Do you remember the 1989 movie Batman? with, with uh, Michael Keaton. Goddamn right. Well, there's the scene where Bruce Wayne wants to take Kim Basinger to dinner. So Alfred and the staff cook him up a dinner, but he's got this giant dining room with like 40 seats on either side of the table. And he puts her at one head of the table. And then he's at the other end of the table. And they do a gag about past the salt because it's 40 yards between them or whatever. That to me is what I imagined like you and Ed Kosky and Heyman were doing with Vince during the pandemic, <laughs> it's like, God damn it. We still got to go to work. And it's you guys in that Batman scene, 40 yards away from each other. So everybody's safe, but we got to know what the fuck Otis is doing this Friday. It's just remarkable. The work ethic that, that happens in this company. And then a report like this comes out where it's like, oh, for personal use. I know, like, I know Vince has a yacht and his name's sexy bitch or whatever it is. I imagine the hours on that motor are similar to my treadmill. They ain't getting used a lot. <laughs> and then supposedly if you believe rick the rumors and innuendo as you like to say he was not supposed to come back and wrestle he was not and after coming back in november he's wrestling in january at the royal rumble <laughs> in a street fight against vince mcmahon yeah Car carry me through how that comes about what was he originally hired to be just an on-air television an, character an on-air on-air character and and he was not just that, TV. Just no. TV. He was not going to wrestle. He was not going to be in the ring. And yeah, a few months later, he's in the ring with the boss. And it, but even that, you know, that had the caveat. It's it's just going to be a street, street fight. fight. It's not a real match. Yeah, this isn't a real match, man. You don't have to. You don't have to do all your signature stuff. This is a street fight with events. It's a special attraction. Right. It's a one-off. Well. <laughs> next so chat me up um in your opinion do you think rick was ever going to be satisfied with that nitro match against sting being his retirement match at the time because i hadn't been around rick on a, a regular basis i didn't know i really didn't know and it was one of those things. He had a great career. It was Ric Flair and, you know, what are, what are we going to do now? And when he came back, the, like I said, the, the issue was come back. We just want you as authority figure and, um, we don't see you in the ring at all. And then, yeah, the rest is kind of history. He, he, you can't deny it. A uh, famous little spot in that uh, Royal Rumble match where um, there's a, a traditional camera used and they take a picture of each other as they're brawling uh, and it's a camera that the Flair family was using and years later 
uh, Rick had a copy of that sent to him by Vince framed. And it was one of his more cool memories or pieces of memorabilia was Vince kind of known for doing stuff like that. Something that he thought was a moment he shared with a talent paying special attention to it, having something framed and shipped to him or just something like a little token of appreciation of a memory or a moment in time. Yeah. Vince is real good about that. If he hones in on one thing, um, he knows something means something to, to somebody. I remember, for example, the, the rock being a big Willie Nelson fan and having a, a guitar and we used it as a prop and, Rock's birthday was coming up, and Vince, how how long did we have? We had not even, I don't think we had a week. And Vince comes to me and, and says, I need a guitar signed by Willie Nelson for The Rock for his birthday. I'm like, okay. Thumbs up. <laughs> Good for you. I'll get it for me. And I'm like, oh man, you know, it was, it was crazy, but, but we actually, Jerry Briscoe helped out tremendously in that regard. And we, we were able to, to get to Willie through, uh, Billy Gibbons was easy top and we're able to get, get a guitar, get it signed and get it all, all taken care of. So to answer your question, yes, Vince, Vince does do that for, for people if he knows there's something special there and uh it's a special moment he'll memorialize it wow i'm reminded that sometimes the rich and successful have a disconnect with reality maybe it's fear that a connection to reality might hinder their success who knows think about it the part of vince's brain that once assigned guitar at a moment's notice also created a paywalled video on demand network five plus years before the rest of his industry the early 2000s, by the way, had some weird times in wrestling, and nothing proves that more than Vince McMahon as ECW champion. You got to hear some of this. Well, let's talk about one of our more controversial moments in the history of pay-per-view. It's up next. Eric Bischoff is promising Vince McMahon backstage that Raw would decimate SmackDown. He said he planned to screw John Cena just as McMahon screwed Bret Hart. And, uh... As Bischoff chanted, you screwed Cena, Cena walked in and he said, so Eric Bischoff screws guys. Not really my thing. And then McMahon asked Cena, what's good in the hood. And then said, keep it up my blank. And then strutted away like George Jefferson. And then we see uh, Booker and Charmel and <laughs> Booker says, tell me he didn't just say that. And I can't believe this actually happened. And if I'm honest with you, I kind of forgot that it was even on this show. until I started doing my research, but here we are 15 years away from maybe one of the more controversial things that Vince ever did on pay-per-view, but you know, context is King, I suppose. Chat me up. Um, just a yeah, minute. I don't think it holds up. Well, no, no shit. Doesn't age. Well, you know, at the time you're doing different things that we would never do now. Eric Bischoff and I just watched the episode where he was fired and they showed a clip of, uh, may young giving him a stink face. And then they came back to her, uh, in the courtroom scene and she's in on the witness stand and she's got her middle and forefinger spread and she's flipping her tongue around in between them. And it's like, you could never do that in 2020. Like that would never in a million years happen. Uh, but Hey, that was pop culture in 05 but my goodness the, if you had if you had this one back you probably wish you had this one to do over huh ah probably so obviously this is something that is uh a sensitive topic these days do you remember this being something that you had to sort of go run past a lot of folks backstage would this have been something that you would have gotten the green light for well i think that there were people whose opinions were asked and you know again it's it just a, a different time in a different place where you did different things that were not, you know, not things that hold up. When I go back and, and I'm into the Alfred Hitchcock hour now, 
taping it every single night. You know, you sit there and you watch some of the things of uh, on television of, of men just basically uh, slapping the shit out of women uh, back and forth as if it was just another day at the office. And it's it's just uh, time has a way of of making things cringeworthy. Do you remember uh, Booker or Charmel having a reaction to this, or are they they understand hey, it's entertainment? We're trying something, might work, might not. You know, again, it, it's just different time, different place, different different mentality. I know this sounds silly, but Vince is somebody we've always believed to be disconnected from pop culture. You know, this is someone who you've sort of joked before in the past would say, "What about Steinfeld?" Instead of Seinfeld because he was just, you know, that's not in his wheelhouse. And there's even been jokes about him listening to certain types of music on the show and things like that. I'm saying all that to ask, does someone have to coach him up on the proper way to say the word? I know that sounds silly, but in hip hop, they use an a and not so pleasant ways. People use the hard R and it's almost become a big joke. I'm sure someone comes to Vince and has the idea. Hey, wouldn't it be hilarious if he did this or he said that? And then they have to make sure he understands that there are intricacies in how the context of, of he's not a child. He's a grown ass man. And you know, it's, it's again, dude, it's different time, different place. No arguing that this is just, uh, whew. if you watch this without the context of who John Cena is and how silly WWE is, as you said, ah, uh, doesn't age well. Uh, do you remember there ever being a, a, a different circumstance where he was trying to talk cool, like try to be hip and just like a lot of our dads do, it just falls a little flat. Like for instance, let me give you an example. I'm sure you've heard of uh WAP this year. It was like the, the late summer anthem. I can't believe that was a, a hit song, but you're familiar with WAP, correct? Yes. So as crazy as it is that that's a song, my dad has no idea what that is or that it exists. Well, during, very recently we were watching football together and an old friend of ours who we hadn't heard from, from a long, in a long time, texted my dad. And I just, as he's telling me, he's like, man, I hadn't heard from this guy in like eight years. Can you believe it? This is so cool. Blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, he's got like a catering business now. He said, what? I said, well, it's like a food truck deal. He's like, really? What's he sell? And I said, wings and pizza. And he said, really? I said, yeah. I said, you should tell him, you know, put him over, make him feel good. Say, Hey man, I can't wait to get some of your WAP wings and pizza. That's his food truck. So my dad, not knowing any better, sent this guy. I can't wait to get some of your WAP. And our mutual friend texted it back and said, was this supposed to go to miss Deborah? Because dad had no idea. And he's like, and he responded and he's like, don't be a stupid bitch. No, my wife doesn't make wings or pizza. I, where would that even come from? And that's when my friend realized probably his, and he said, my son wings and pizza. So has, have you ever seen Vince, you know, try to, Hey, I'm cool. I'm hip. I know the things. I'm, as much as me or you or anybody else. I mean, I'm just hoping you can give me a lighthearted story so we can move off of him dropping the end bomb and just have no, a good show. I ain't got no lighthearted story. Okay, cool. But the other subplot or storyline going on here is styles and Taz. Of course, in this era, we've just fired Jim Ross. Joey styles is his replacement. He's the voice of raw. Taz is the, one of the voices on SmackDown with Michael Cole. And they're doing commentary here together. And Taz says something like, I'd be happy not to have to work with you again. And Styles said once every 10 years is fine. And Taz said he hasn't missed him. And Styles said, I'm done with him. Obviously we've talked, we've had a lot of fun talking about our pal Taz over the years, Did he have real life issues with Joey Styles, or is this all just part of a storyline building towards, you know, some crescendo with raw versus SmackDown. Yeah, it was the brand rivalry there. I don't know if there was ever any heat there one way or another. Um, I'm sure Taz has had a lot of heat with a lot of people throughout the years. That you know, Taz is one of those guys, very quiet, likes to keep to himself. 
and has been misunderstood yes. quite a bit throughout his career. I would agree. So, yeah, they, I, no, this was, to my knowledge, I think that uh, Joey and Taz are friendly. But for more great stuff today, today we're doing something that uh, I enjoy. It's the anniversary shows. And yesterday uh, was the 15 year anniversary of No Way Out 2005. It went down on February 20th from the Mellon Arena in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It drew 9,500 fans, did about 240,000 buys on pay per view, which ended up being the second lowest in 2000, 2005 behind No Mercy in October. This is, in fact, the seventh No Way Out pay per view. It is a SmackDown branded event. There's two main events on this show, one of which is very interesting. It's a barbed wire cage match for the WWE title. It's JBL defending against big show there. And then we also get the hometown boy, Kurt angle against John Cena. We're coming off the Royal rumble where we saw Batista win it. Of course, Vince would tear both quads on his incident, getting into the ring. Of course, the finish didn't go exactly as planned. Briefly tell everybody about the chairman and his quad injury. Oh God. Yeah, it was uh, supposed to be a John Cena elimination with Batista winning the Rumble. And when they went for the spot, whatever happened, Dave lost his balance and both Cena and Batista came out at the same time. Uh, No, it wasn't supposed to happen, folks. And that wasn't the planned finish. And it was a a, a bit of a screw up there. But thank God... At least it was close. You know what I mean? It it looked like they both hit at the same time. And is we're all going, fuck. Uh, We're talking about what we're going to do before you know it. Vince is out the curtain. And Vince is storming down to the ring. And when Vince went to slide into the ring, he tore his quad. And he went to get up and he couldn't get up because his quad wasn't there. I mean, it just, he was screwed. And Vince restarted the match. Batista got rid of uh, Cena and what have you, and they helped Vince to the back, but he was very adamant about not being helped too much. And at that time, you know, as he wasn't being helped too much, he tore his other quad. And um, very interesting night, to say the least. Yeah, it sounds like a horrific night. We've covered that one a few different times. Let's talk about, let's talk a little bit about Vince. Um, this has got to be, you know, you're talking about how you're burnt out. This has got to be one of the worst times of his life because now, because of this torn quad injury, you know, a couple things have to change. He can't be around these wrestling events that are the centerpiece of his life and business personally, professionally, etc. And B he can't work out. And what we've heard about Vince is that. He is just a freak when it comes to that, to the point where sometimes when you guys land in the middle of the morning or middle of the night, he still wants to go straight to the gym to train before he does anything else. How off his rocker was Vince in this era where he can't go to shows and he can't go work out. He had to just be going crazy in his house, right? Yes and no. I mean, we say can't work out. Vince was probably working out his upper body harder than he ever had in his life during this time. However, his favorite body part is his legs. He loves to work legs. Didn't get the memo from Hawk and Randy Savage. It's an upper body business. Uh huh. Um, so he was working out harder and contrary to what people thought he was involved and he was out there and recovered, um, did everything that I would advise against doing, but probably recovered four months ahead of projections. Wow. Um, just by, you know, again, he would, he did a different type of rehab and he religiously did it and he got in there and he did everything that he had to do so that he would get back. And I don't think that it was, it wasn't even God a month before he was back on the road. Was there a concern of his just because he's always been, uh, jacked and he's always, you know, presented himself a certain way. Was it a concern of his to, because we've heard like, uh, never sell it that type of thing. Very macho machismo. Was there a part of him that's sort of old school and doesn't, I don't want anybody to see me in a wheelchair. I don't want anybody to see me with a walker, that type of thing. Um, no, I think it's just more of a, I think that's the persona. 
I think that that's what a lot of people think and, and want to believe. Uh, Vince is just one of those guys that is going to do whatever he can to get beyond that. And he did do that in this situation where it was like, holy fuck, um, you're back. So in that regard, yeah, he's crazy and uh, has a work ethic that is unmatched in that regard so that his rehab matched the work ethic of everything else that he did where he was religious and doing everything that he could. If it, if it meant doing one thing extra, he would do two things extra just to get back to where he wanted to be. And that was, you know, out amongst everybody. So no surprise with that. Let's talk about Vince. You know, we briefly touched on uh, him jumping into the ring at WrestleMania or Royal rumble rather and tearing both quads. Well, as you can imagine, he has to have surgery to repair those. And Wade Keller would write answering the question of whether Vince McMahon would let people see him in a wheelchair. He showed up last Friday at MSG, his favorite arena for a raw house show. He was in a wheelchair backstage with his legs, both wrapped and elevated. Stephanie Shane and Linda McMahon were also backstage. He was greeted by a number of wrestlers. He did not show himself publicly in front of the crowd. Uh, but the show does well. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's up from prior MSG house shows. And, uh, the report would also continue office staffers have been affected by Vince's absence from the office on a regular basis. As some have had to make trips between the office or production studio in his home to let him see tapes of pre-produced videos for his approval or critiquing the estimates for the time it will take him to get back on his feet and traveling to all events is about six months due to the serious nature of the double quad tears. Now we know Vince McMahon ain't going to sit like this for six months, but still, um, Vince McMahon in a wheelchair, not a sight. A lot of people ever thought they would see and, uh, maybe perhaps causing some inconveniences running back and forth. What do you remember about Vince's time post-surgery? Well, he worked his ass off to get to the point of being able to WrestleMania is three days, ladies and gentlemen. Oh shit. <sighs> okay. I'll tell you what. I, that, see, that was just a, that was just a quick text. That one I can answer boom right right there and we're good to go. Um, you know, Vince is is I think that the way a good way to describe it would be if you have one thing that you really love, love to do the one thing, that no matter what happens you're going to do, whether it's your favorite meal, it's your, your favorite thing to, to do just whatever it is, you got to go play Madden on Tuesday. Vince McMahon's favorite thing to do was work out. Right. And his favorite workout his legs. So looking at that was his goal. He wanted to get back to be where he could work out all the time. And he was working out like a madman. Um, but he, he couldn't do legs the way that he loved to do legs. So he was, he was constantly just rehabilitating, doing everything that he could to be back on his feet and, and get rolling. So that was a priority for him. And, it was a little inconvenient for some folks, but for others that are used to, you know, you, you're working around the chairman's schedule and what he needs, and that's what you do. So you, you get there and and go for it. Was he even more cantankerous uh, when he's wheelchair bound than normal? Mm, not really. Frustrate, frustrated with himself, yes, but not, no, not really. Cantankerous. That's a southern word. It's a hell right of there. a wine, by the way. Yeah, it is. Well, he does one for Raw as well. Um, Keller would say the two messages were number one, slow it down in the ring and cut back on needless high spots and tell a story instead. And number two, reestablish a set of rules so that breaking rules mean something. And. 
Keller would say the speech, a rare, all wrestlers, all staffers meeting lasted about 40 minutes and included an open forum Q and a session afterwards. Overall, his speech to the raw crew was met with more praise and enthusiasm than his more threatening condescending speech the week before to the SmackDown crew was. While his SmackDown speech was laced with threats of layoffs, the raw speech was all positive. Part of the contrast in the speeches is that McMahon sees the raw crew as the more experienced group on the more established show. And they need to be talked to like an NBA coach would talk to someone in their mid twenties and mid 30 something pro athletes. He sees the SmackDown crew as the less experienced crew with ex- without experienced leaders at the level of triple H or Shawn Michaels who need to be talked to more like a college coach would talk to 18 to 22 year old amateur basketball players. What do you think about the way he describes the way you have to handle the different groups? Or is it more of a story of Vince realizing shit that didn't go the way I planned for SmackDown and maybe changing the approach a little bit for all. It's basically the same speech, (laughs) basically the same exact speech, different audience and different people getting back to whoever the hell they were getting back to with a different perception of it. The speeches were the same. Same message, same everything. And two different groups took it two different ways. Let me ask you this. When he talks about without experienced leaders, he he references wrestlers. If there was a difference in the speeches, how much of it is based on talking to a crew that's led by Paul Heyman and Vince just having a certain opinion about him one way or another? Well, I don't know that the crew was led by Paul Heyman on, on the... Uh, SmackDown side, you had Undertaker and uh, Good God. I didn't yeah. mean. I didn't mean in ring. I just mean if this is their supposed creative influencer behind the scenes, because you've told us before that he was the head writer for SmackDown and Brian was more for Raw. But if Brian was perceived as more of a um, McMahon disciple, whereas Heyman was more contrarian, would that affect the way the speeches were handled, or no? it may have affected the way the speeches were interpreted. Okay. But again, the speeches were the same. That's what I'm trying to explain the speech. There weren't two different speeches. He gave the exact same message to the raw crew. Let me, it was the raw crew interpreted it and they perceived it differently than the SmackDown crew did. Let me ask you about the open Q and a, because I feel like this would be something where Vince would probably sincerely say, if anyone has any questions, by all means ask. But I feel like a lot of people are probably looking around like nobody better raise their fucking hand. And then if someone does ask a question, maybe some of the more senior folks are like, look at this fucking asshole asking questions of Vince. Does that dynamic exist? Yes, definitely. And here's why. A lot of times I think that people, when they get to the point of anybody have any questions, guys are like, let's just get the fuck out of here. Absolutely. Yeah. God damn it. We get it. Okay. We're going to, you know, we're going to slow down. We're going to be better. Rah, rah, hip, hip, hooray. God, don't ask any questions. And then somebody asks a question and that opens up another fucking can of worms. And then somebody else will make another comment. That it's just like, shut up and let's go right or wrong. That's the sentiment. Who, who are some folks who would raise their hand and ask questions? Usually the younger talent. Uh, I don't know anybody specifically by name, but it was usually, it was usually some of the younger talent that just, uh, I got a question, sir. When are we going to get our pay for, uh, I worked in, uh, Nova Scotia and I got paid for the and questions like that. That Vince be, doesn't have the answer to off the top of his head anyway. Exactly. <laughs> or just some off the wall. Um, nitpicky shit that may only pertain to that one person. So it, it, it was, it was always funny to see who would ask the questions and what questions we would get, because most of the time the sentiment was, let's go, let's get out of here next. You're going to love this when, you know, we're talking about slow down, tell a story. Don't take all these crazy risks. Wade Keller wrote some wrestlers though. See, this philosophy is nothing more than an attempt by triple H to slow everybody down to the level he is physically capable of. 
Due to injuries, he can't keep up with a faster pace, more athletic style. Hunter is as influential as anyone in WWE other than McMahon. And the last thing he wants to be is seen as obsolete in comparison to his colleagues pushing to get the top spot he now occupies. There was also frustration with wrestlers who agree with the work rate style McMahon endorsed, but see it as unrealistic since most TV matches last under five minutes. Asking wrestlers to work a five minute match in the same style as a 30 minute Hunter Sean match is seen as career killing. Your thoughts? Well, it's silly to even put Triple H in that context there, especially at that time. But no, that is something that Vince has always preached as far as slowing down and telling stories. And that comes from Pat Patterson. And it comes from the agents that come from another time. However, it's a double edged sword. When you talk about having, as you just said, having a five minute match on television, when you haven't even in a, you want to tell me a story, you want to slow down. I haven't even set the heat at five minutes. So you have to condense a 30 minute match into a five minute match because that's the only allocation window allocation you have on television. And it's tough to do. And it just left people more confused than anything. And what he was saying is just a lot of the craziness limit it. Let's try and tell a story here. Don't go out 900 miles an hour and just King Cancun and move on to the next thing and not sell anything. If you're going to do something big and a crazy, crazy spot that looks like it should kill both guys, sell it, take your time, make it mean something versus do this crazy spot and then get right up 10 seconds later and like nothing ever happened and move on to the next spot. That's what he's trying to say, but it, it's contradictory no matter how you look at it because you're telling guys slow down. Oh, Hey, how long do I have for my match tonight? You got four minutes. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's tough to do. Another wrestler would say the meetings are good. They make us feel like we're more part of a team. It makes you realize what's right and what's wrong, or at least management is looking for you to be doing in the past. We didn't really know what Vince was thinking. Now, at least we do. And when he tells us the meetings are equal by that, I mean, it's not a beatdown session. It's 50% good and 50% bad. Hey, rip us apart. Let us know how to get better. We're all getting more thick skinned. When he says, this is your chance to ante up. There are these spots that if you want them and will work for them, I thought it was a nice message. Everyone else seems to think so too. And another wrestler told Wade, it was a good speech. What he said made sense. So by and large, it's received pretty well. You were there. Did you think there was any sort of negativity in these or was it just typical Vince? I thought it was typical Vince and it was Vince opening up what I think always helps is when Vince would address the troops because now you're hearing it directly from him. You're not hearing it from me. You're not hearing it from Johnny. You're not hearing it from Jr. You're not hearing it from Paul or Michael or anybody else. You're hearing it directly from Vince with Vince's passion and Vince's vision. So when you do that, you, the boys feel better. It's like, Hey, took time to tell me. So that, that did make him feel better. And, I, and to me, it was just Vince. And if he had time to do that more often, I think it would be healthier. One of the things that was written that I found interesting is one of the wrestlers who didn't enjoy the meetings told Wade, he's not performing on TV anymore and he wants an audience. So therefore the wrestlers are his audience. Now, I, I think that's way, way out of place. Does that sound like sour grapes to you? Yes. That's silly. So the, uh, the show doesn't happen without some fireworks. Wade Keller would write that when a pregnant Dawn Marie arrived, she's welcoming everybody and saying hello. And she offers a handshake to Francine, but Francine ain't having it. They have uh, a bit of a, a rude conversation with one another. Did you know about or did you think that there would be any sort of backstage hijinks here? I mean, it's almost become legendary that the ECW locker room at times could be like the goddamn okay corral. 
did you assume that because this was under the WWE banner that everybody would be on their best behavior and none of that shit would exist because perhaps a lot of these talents saw this as an opportunity to maybe do more with the company? Well, you would hope that professionals would act professionally. As a result of this Don Marie Francine incident, they do a pre-show meeting with the talent that Vince McMahon and Johnny Ace run late in the afternoon. And Vince specifically says, Hey, you got to put any old grudges to the side for the night. And he asks everyone to be professional and settle any disputes they have at another time and another place, which of course is going to be something that becomes relevant later in the show with JBL. Um, we'll talk about that later. It's, it's also something I learned in my research that I didn't know before we started doing these podcasts, that Vince McMahon was working the gorilla position throughout the show sitting right next to Paul Heyman. And he's also helping produce the announcers. This is, uh, I don't know. We've seen a lot of footage over the years of you sitting next to Vince and gorilla. It's a little hard for me to imagine Paul Heyman and Vince McMahon sitting side by side in gorilla. It feels like that's oil and water as far as their view on wrestling, especially when it comes to ECW. Do I have that wrong? No, they're two producers that, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe because it's normal, um, to those that actually exist in that world, it's, there's nothing abnormal about it. Supposedly the WWE agents are here, uh, Johnny Ace, Gerald Briscoe, Arn Anderson, uh, Tony Gurria, Ricky Steamboat and fit Finley. They're all here to work backstage, but they're not being intrusive. According to one wrestler that talked to Wade Keller. They're letting the guys sort of do what they want to do. And instead of dictating to them, they say, Hey, what'd you guys have in mind? We're here if you need anything. So more of a support role. How would you say that's different from say a raw or a SmackDown and what the agents would do these days? I, you know, for the most part, the producers help the talent lay out their matches and let them know what is in store for them for the evening. Um, I don't know how this was done since I wasn't there, but I can only imagine that a lot of the, that was taken care of before the guys ever even got to the arena so that people knew who they were working with, knew what was expected of them before they stepped foot in the building that day. And the producers were there just make sure that there was, wasn't anything that was going to be too crazy or uh, offer their assistance in putting things together and making it flow and work better. Another day at the office. Stephanie and triple H did not attend the show. Shane McMahon is spotted at the building early in the day. Let's uh, also talk about Shane McMahon. It's been written over the years that Shane McMahon was a big ECW fan during their original run. Do you remember having conversations with Shane about ECW or maybe taking his temperature on what he thought of one night stand and, and the idea of doing a reunion show? Shane was a big fan of ECW and he, he enjoyed it. And just like the, the presentation of the show, the television show. So that was something that he followed. He watched it, uh, much more so than anyone else. And it, uh, you know, yeah, he liked it. I don't know that there was anything really more to it than that. On, uh, March 5th, 2007, Shane comes back to inform his father, Vince, about the guest referee for the battle of the billionaires. He tells them that, uh, their opponents on the board of directors had won the vote five to four and the McMahon's had intended for Shane to be the referee, but instead now it's going to be stone cold, Steve Austin. As we know, of course, Vince loses, gets his head shaved. Shane had to be loving this. Vince getting his head shaved? Yeah. <laughs> Not as much as me. Has to be I've been, wanting to get, I've been wanting to get that head of hair for a while. At Backlash, this is a real thing. The ECW Championship's on the line. Shane, along with Vince McMahon and Umaga, are going to defeat Lashley for the title. Vince gains the pin. So now Vince McMahon is the ECW World Champion. Next time I see Finally you, a champion that those three letters could be proud of. I'm going to punch you square in the dick. Next time I see you. Why? 
just for a, for allowing that to happen and B for saying that. Can you name anyone better? No, you cannot. So, okay, we'll move on. Um, it seems like once upon a time, Shane would have been in these matches, but instead it's Vince here. What's up with that? Like, you know, there's lots of handicap matches and even at one night stand, Shane and Umaga are going to try to help Vince retain the ECW title against Lashley, but fail, you know, what sort of time it feels like, well, this is a Shane spot, but now here it's Vince. Did Vince just have a wild hair? Did he really like being do rag Vince? Do rag Vince was cool. Do rag, do rag Vince is cool. Do rag Vince with the ECW world championship. That, there you go. It feels that's, like it's right out of a cartoon. I like it. That's cash. It actually, you know, it really does. Yeah. You know, and you could probably, you would get the strut with the way they would like draw the little lines on the yeah. cartoon too. Yep. Uh, Smackdown on August 4th has JBL and Batista announced their match at SummerSlam. It's going to be a no holds barred match and Orton and Undertaker confirmed their SummerSlam match. This episode also features Eddie serving Ray <laughs> with custody papers for Dominic. Who do you think drew those up? Would that have been, uh, your boy, Clarence Mason, who drew those up? Do we cheat them and how? Oh yeah. Who could forget them? Uh, during the same week, Bret Hart comes to terms with the WWE and Vince McMahon about working with the company to do a DVD regarding his career. This is a big deal because it's been a no fly zone for a long time. A lot of hurt feelings after the, the screw job in 97, obviously it goes to another level after Owen's tragic death. So to hear that Brett was going to do something with the company again was really exciting for longtime Brett Hart fans. I was fired up about this. And I think a lot of people were probably shocked that this even has an opportunity to be a thing, but it doesn't feel like anybody can keep grudges with the company forever. Were you surprised when they mended fences here and, and decided to work on a project together? Nothing surprises me. And it just was a matter of time before it actually was going to happen. I think everyone knew it was going to happen. So when it did, no, nah, it wasn't a, a big surprise or shock or anything like that. It was two adults that got over their differences and realized that stakes were made on both sides and were able to move on. So that's in a nutshell, what it came down to. I think that sometimes people believe what they see on TV. And yes, there, there were look, no doubt about it. There were hostilities there, but in the, in the end, we're all human. We all make mistakes and, and we, we can all forgive, uh, don't necessarily have to forget, but you can forgive and move on. And that's what happened here. So once Brett and Vince were able to meet and get, get over all of that other shit. Things were at least moving in the right direction. Let me ask, you know, I don't know what you know or don't know. And we, that's a rule. We don't talk about current stuff, but I just saw a note the other day that this DVD has been removed from the network. Is this more Brett and Vince? You think hokey pokey, or is that a network glitch or oh, I have no idea. It's just real random. Somebody said all of a sudden, a lot of the Bret Hart stuff was off the network. And I was like, well, I don't know how that would even be uh, in his book. He describes finding out that he was going to be Vince McMahon's son as being very surreal. He says, I figured it would just be another day at work, but mid afternoon at rehearsal, Vince's right hand man, Bruce Pritchard told me to meet him backstage. And when I got there, the first thing he did was demand my phone. I could tell from his expression, he was dead serious. So I handed it over. Then he said the words that changed my life. You're Vince's son. What do you remember about the creative leading up to this reveal and what might've supposed to have happened before you pivoted and went to Hornswoggle as the big reveal? Well, I don't know that there was ever a, a firm, this is what's going to happen. I know that at one point, Mr. Kennedy was bantered back and forth about being Vince's son and that we would do a storyline with Ken Kennedy to be the illegitimate heir to the McMahon throne and, and family and throw a whole new dynamic into the, 
the family squabbles that the McMahon family would have on there. And then, you know, it went to the absurd. Could it be Boogeyman? Uh, could it be Triple H? Could it be The Undertaker? You know, all these different talent that could be the illegitimate heir to the throne. And at one point, half-assed joking, what if it was Hornswoggle? Mm. And it's like, God damn, he's Irish. Of course he could. Um, and then the the Irish factor, you know, Vince kept coming back to that because he, he loves that shit. And, and the, to you would have to have an Irish son and you would have to have someone that makes sense. Therefore, of course it makes sense to have an Irish little fellow there that could be Vince's son and we just had fun with it and, and ran with the damn thing. Do you remember who pitched? Oh, what if it was Hornswoggle? I don't, I think all of us may have laughed about it and pitched it at some point. Um, that one actually may have been Brian, but, uh, I think it might've been me. I don't know. Talk to us about the importance of grabbing his phone. I mean, obviously you don't want to leak and you don't, I mean, you want this to be a genuine surprise. How do you make the determination from this is a time to ask for a phone versus nah, it doesn't matter. Well, I, it was a big deal. It was the reveal that night of Vince's son. Everybody had, everybody knew the answer. Ah, it's going to be Kennedy. That's where we wanted everybody to go. Then it was between Kennedy and Triple H. Right. So we wanted to, to take it all the way down there and then have that last minute swerve with its horn swoggle. And the hell was that? I think you just loaded uh, Windows 95. Oh, cool. Hey, right. so let me ask, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you just said there that, Hey, everybody knew it was going to be Kennedy. It does feel like sometimes when you're watching wrestling at times, it can become predictable and you're like, well, obviously this is what they're going to do. And I feel like sometimes just for the sake of, no, that's not what we're going to do. They pivot and they do something outrageous in another direction that no one can call. And it does get a big reaction that night, but how often do you think, and I'm not saying it was the case in this particular scenario, how often do you think a big pivot like that is done? And then effectively it doesn't work as well long-term as what the original plan would have been, but we felt the pressure since everyone sort of quote unquote knew what we were going to do that we shouldn't just stay the course. We needed to get the big pop for the swerve, bro. How often do you think that happens? It depends. I mean, it really does depend on the story and in what that story can bring. And if it makes sense, you know, does it add an entertaining element to the story? And if it does, then shit, yeah, you're going to look at it and uh, say, why not? After the Royal Rumble, Mr. McMahon would decide to punish Hornswoggle for his failure by making him join the kiss my ass club, except he bit his ass instead. And I guess this is sort of an old midget wrestling standard staple spot brought to the modern era. If you will hornswoggle biting Vince McMahon's ass. How would you put that? I mean, if you were trying to, uh, I don't know, place like a, a job ad on monster.com or something like that. Need little person to bite billionaire's ass, apply below. What's that like? Yeah, I, think, I don't know that it was uh, put that way. I'm pretty sure it was just need ass biter. <laughs> of course. No tongue. This leads to. Don't knock it till you try it. That led to Vince making a match between the two of them for Raw the next week. You heard me. Vince McMahon versus Hornswoggle. During the match, Vince tries to spank Hornswoggle to teach him a lesson, which brings Finley out who interferes with the shillelagh and helps Dylan do what stone cold never could. He pins Vince McMahon. 
And it's a pretty rare sight to see Vince McMahon get in a ring. What leads him to want to do this? Like, does Vince just enamored with the concept of a, of a leprechaun character? Was he missing some, uh, man, I want to get out there and perform for the crowd. I mean, we've heard old time wrestlers say, man, it's just nothing like it. It's such a high, it's such a rush. Did Vince just want to put himself in this spot or did he just love the leprechaun storyline? Well, it was family. Oh God. So sometimes you have to teach your family a lesson and it was a highly entertaining lesson to, <laughs> to see to see Vince in there with the leprechaun. That was just some good, funny shit. Finally, there's been chatter for 10 plus years on if Vince McMahon will ever retire. What say you, Bruce? Uh, Chris writes in, do you think Vince will ever retire? That's an interesting question because, you know, we've heard lots of rumor and innuendo about a succession plan. And even if you know, I don't want you to share it with us here, but it's hard to imagine knowing the way we as fans have always heard that Vince sort of eats, lives and breathes the wrestling business that he would ever say, nah, I'm just going to go get in my rocking chair. I just don't see it. Never. As long as Vince is breathing in and breathing out, Vince will be working. Um, I've, I've, I've never encountered any, anyone with the work ethic of Vince McMahon. No, no, I don't think anybody can argue that. I mean, we've always heard all about it. And that's going to do it for this week's episode of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. You wanted it, and we hope you enjoyed this megasode. We like to call Vince McMahon versus the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Conrad and Bruce will see you next week right here on Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.